All right, I think I have started the recording. <clears throat> the uh, audio levels look correct. Got the microphone. And um, it is time for class. So let me start the screen share. And I'll be sharing Google Chrome. And going to week eight, start in presentation mode. And then pulling up the speaker notes. <clears throat> which one must do twice. And we now have speaker notes. Very good. All right, so I think we can get started. It is 3.30. It is Saturday, March 27th. This is Mike Wilkes. And this is Information System Security and Management, week eight. This week's lecture is Documentation and design, uh, one of my favorite lectures, actually, um, because of the contents. Um, I love good documentation. I love inspiring people to have the documentation instinct. And uh, this is one of my ways of doing that, right? By having a whole class uh, dedicated to the topic. So let me make this slide notes a little bit different shape so I can see a little bit more of the slides. There we go. Okay. so. A picture is worth a thousand words, as the adage goes, and this is true. One good diagram or picture of an application and how it works is simply priceless, especially when investigating an incident. But the best approach is to have pictures and words, lots of words, freshly written words that are reviewed and approved and published on a regular basis. Documentation is a regulatory requirement for many companies and is unquestionably deemed a best practice. Otherwise, you have a team of superheroes who know how to build, deploy, and support the infrastructure and applications, but whom engender a very high risk. There are single points of failures, SPOFs, uh, and there is tribal knowledge, as it's called, when an organization does not have good documentation, uh, and it's something that needs to be addressed by the information security team and its management. You can also avoid having a certain type of incident occur when healthy and accurate documentation habits are instilled in the team. It makes everyone's life easier. No assumptions about what scripts to run after deployment. Document the process and your quality of life will improve immeasurably. All right, so documentation. Funny quote here, uh, the guy who knows about computers is the last person you want to have creating documentation for people who don't understand computers. Uh, this was a quote from Adam Osborne. Now, while I don't actually share Adam Osborne's view on the subject, I do understand the intention of the statement. Documentation is often outdated, unloved, and obtuse. Osborne was known uh, to frequent the homebrew, homebrew computer club's meetings around 1975. He created the first commercially available portable computer, the Osborne One, shown here. Uh, and it was released in April 1981 and was the first commercially successful portable computer. Uh, let me see, let me look at it more closely here. Uh, what you can see, in case you don't recognize these things, is a uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive uh, on the left top, another five and a quarter inch floppy drive on the upper right. Uh, a small display screen in the middle, uh, probably 640 by 480 uh, characters, um, or no, characters, um, yeah, or pixels, yeah, I think pixels, anyway, um, and then a ribbon cable uh, popping out of it uh, and into the keyboard, and this is what would be now referred to as a luggable, right, I'm sure it was a portable computer, uh, but I imagine it probably weighed, you know, 30 pounds or something like that. Uh, but its dimensions were constrained by what would fit underneath the um, space in an airplane, uh, underneath a seat. Um, because, you know, if you travel with it, you're not going to want to put this through checked baggage, right? And I think you can see um, a serial uh, port uh, right next to, um, what, uh, 
some other controller. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Uh, but anyway, the serial port is an RS-232, uh, which had a lot of pins back then, uh, which eventually became um, a, a PC serial port, which is kind of a round um, thing for keyboards. Uh, and then eventually evolved into the universal serial port, uh, the USB, or universal serial bus, uh, and then became, you know, these small USB-C um, connectors that we have now. Um, but anyway, so this is a precursor to all those things, and this is an Osborne computer. In case you've not been to a computer museum, uh, you may not recognize uh, that I'm sure it's worth something to the museum uh, world at this point and collectors. All right, the documentation instinct. <clears throat> Good habits are encouraged and become instinctual over time. Instinct, the word instinct comes from the Latin instinctus or impulse. So writing documentation needs to become, in my mind, a daily habit. There are many communication channels that count as documentation, which we'll look at in a minute. But instilling the documentation impulse or habit is something that takes time. Some colleagues will pick it up quickly, but even those will need to be shown how to outline a page and get something started. It's often the specter of having to create a finished product that impedes many people from even starting a simple one-page document. Uh, you know, like a how-to, uh, for example, a simple one-page how-to on, on how to do something. Uh, make sure that they know that WIPS, uh, which is a three-letter acronym for work in progress, that WIPS are okay. And that starting the page is a mental barrier that once you've crossed it a few times, it fades away and the act of documentation begins to build momentum in a person and across teams. Uh, so one of the first things I do whenever I start somewhere is to start a wiki page and start documenting the onboarding process for myself and for the person that's gonna come after me as the next new hire on the InfoSec team. Uh, this is just you know uh, an efficiency thing and it's a sharing of information. I don't necessarily populate a lot of bookmarks on my personal web browser. I start making a quick links uh, page and I just put in the links to all the tools that I might want to know and use that I learned about in my first week, my first month, uh, in my first uh, quarter uh, working somewhere. That turns out to be quite helpful because uh, you're doing knowledge sharing and you're helping people find these links that may be buried, you know, um, or you know, people build them up over time, and there's no centralized publication in most companies um, of a set of bookmarks uh, to keep people to know where the HR page is, uh, where the monitoring tool is, you know, how to get to, um, you know, a Google site, you know, that's maybe used for an internet, uh, a wiki, um, various JIRA projects, you know, things like that. Uh, so that's certainly uh, one of those early, easy things to do and uh, makes life um, better uh, immediately. And of course, if people start to realize that there is a document that has links, they'll actually start looking for links, right? Rather than um, wasting time trying to find them, uh, they'll know that they can just go onto the wiki and type in a keyword and potentially find what they're looking for. And that increases people's expectation that there's good documentation available. Uh, wikis are like living documents. I prefer that to using Google Docs or file shares, you know, full of folders and files, because it's a lot easier to search uh, and browse. Um, you don't know where to look, you know, on a file share, and you may not have permission to even see that the document exists um, in a Google Drive. And while it is possible to have lots of co collaboration tools in the cloud, um, I often like to think that um, people can document however they want. Uh, if they do want to make a Google site or a Google Drive and a folder, uh, they should at least link it back to some system of record like a wiki uh, so that people can say, okay, this is the team. The team doesn't document their work here, they document it somewhere else, but at least leave that breadcrumb behind for them to find so that they can browse to your documentation and be able to consume it um, asynchronously whenever they need it, right? And rather than having to ask and send an email or, or Slack someone to find out what's going on. <coughs> so what are some of the questions to be asked? Why should we document? Well, to capture tribal knowledge. Um, to create competitive advantage, uh, to ensure transparency, and to deliver training. Now, on the right uh, on this slide, you see the instructions on a box of toothpicks. Douglas Adams' book, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. <coughs> um, actually, it's a, 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 a comical or oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, long day, um, but I, I will get through it. Um, 
uh, so long and thanks for all the fish. It was um, book four in a trilogy, of course, which is funny because a trilogy should have three books um, to the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. In this book, uh, there's a character whose name is Wonko the Sane. And uh, the quote that I have here is, it seemed to me, said Wonko the Sane, that any civilization that had so far lost its head as to need to include, <coughs> apologies, <coughs> it seemed to me, said Wonko the Sane, that any civilization that had so far lost its head as to need to include a set of detailed instructions for use in a package of toothpicks was no longer a civilization in which I could live and stay sane. So in the book, Wonko um, actually built an insane, insane asylum. <coughs> and um, he basically built a building with an inside out ar architecture. So um, he basically you know, put the whole world into an insane asylum by building his um, home inside out. And so his inner courtyard was the outside and everything outside of his walls was the insane asylum. But anyway, it's, um, if you've never read Douglas Adams, um, I highly recommend it. It's very uh, amusing and clever. And uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy is great uh, if you've never experienced it. Um, so anyway, I wanted to include the uh, toothpick instructions here as sort of an absurd example of documentation. You know, hold stick near center of its length, moisten pointed end in mouth, insert in tooth space, blunt end next to gum, use gentle in and out motion. Uh, so that's my humorous slide for documentation. Uh, there's a couple other funny ones hopefully coming up as well. So let's talk about capturing tribal knowledge. In many organizations, the team just sort of knows what to do and it does it day after day, week after week. <clears throat> that constitutes a serious risk, a serious information security risk, um, a ser serious knowledge management risk. Tribal knowledge is information or knowledge that is known within a tribe, but is often unknown outside of it. A tribe in this sense may be a group or a subgroup of people that share a common knowledge. From a corporate perspective, tribal knowledge or know-how is the collective wisdom of the organization. This term is, is used most when referencing information that may be known by others in order, may need to be known by others in order to produce quality products or services. Uh, tacit knowledge uh, is tribal knowledge. Documentation transforms tribal knowledge into formal knowledge that can be preserved. Uh, shown here, a, uh, an abacus, a uh, quite old one, if I remember correctly. And um, the ability to, you know, to do math uh, without a computer um, has been around for a long time. And um, if people don't know how to use an abacus anymore, you could think of that as potentially knowledge management and a loss. If people eventually can only learn how to ask their voice assistant, um, you know, what is, um, you know, 10 to the third or, you know, use a calculator and, and to not be able to calculate themselves. So that was my example of how to capture that aspect. Uh, one of the other factors that we're exploring for why document <clears throat> is to create competitive advantage. Documentation of core processes uh, creates a competitive advantage with regard to knowledge management. Document processes and procedures from day one. I actually like to assign the onboarding checklist to each new employee. So it teaches them to document early, essentially their first week, and refines the documentation with a set of fresh eyes for every new arrival. So that's what helps keep it fresh um, and relevant and up to date because things change. Uh, when I am onboarded and write up, you know, what I did my first day or first week um, in terms of getting accounts and, you know, reaching out, um, joining, you know, distribution lists and mailing lists, uh, getting access to shared folders and resources, putting in tickets, you know, for this access uh, will change over time. And so this is one way of keeping the documentation fresh. And there's an added benefit that the new hire, they kind of earn their wiki badge, right, for making their first page edit. And it helps get them over this, you know, sort of fear of, of, well, I'm new here. I just started. How can I start writing documentation for the organization? Um, anyway, cross-training is also easier uh, when you have good documentation. <clears throat> and it's more successful when there's a basic set of documentation available. I often like to think of buddy programs where you pair a couple of people, right? A new hire or a junior with a senior. Uh, and uh, they can use it for formal mentoring uh, or just informal buddy um, pairings uh, is another method for enterprise knowledge management. 
documentation is critical for this process of, of cross training to be consistent and impactful. Uh, and also uh, documentation and why document uh, it ensures transparency. Friction is any force that or process that removes energy from a system over time. Transparency reduces business friction. So technical debt can come from many sources. It can come from poor communication. Poor communication is friction and sometimes stems from a lack of documentation. Uh, failed deployments can be avoided, avoided, for example, with clear requirements, specifications, <clears throat> and documentations on how to do deployments. And of course, at some point, it should be automated, but that doesn't relieve us of the responsibility of creating documentation. <clears throat> the deployment scripts should have comments. They should be parameterized so that they can be reused for deploying different types of um, packages and uh, in, in different environments, for example. Uh, and so there's a lot of room uh, for documentation to influence practice and uh, to help make it <clears throat> easier, like I said, and less error prone uh, when it's done manually or someone does it one way and, and another person deploys and releases it uh, a different way. Uh, it's not a good thing if you have 60 applications and 70 ways of deploying them, right? You wanna have uh, repeatable, consistent and scripted uh, techniques. Documentation can make that easier. Uh, so that at least they follow the same recipe if you haven't actually turned it into code, right? Infrastructure as code is the bit of the mantra here. And of course, delivering training. Uh, there are three <clears throat> main learning styles that I'd like to discuss for a minute. Uh, visual, verbal, and kinesthetic uh, or tactile. Uh, good documentation should support all styles. Documentation alone is not sufficient, though. It is definitely necessary, but remember that someone needs to read the documentation. They need to understand it and they need to make use of it in order to be an effective tool and to become part of the organizational culture. So just the act of writing documentation doesn't mean that people are using it. You need to socialize it, make sure people expect it to be there and make sure people check it. Uh, you certainly don't want someone downloading a standard operating procedure on how to deploy a virtual server into a QA cluster, for example. And then you've changed the documentation, but they downloaded a copy of it and they're still working off of the old copy. Uh, so you want what's referred to as living documentation. And here I'm thinking of like run books and wiki pages. And so don't um, encourage people to sort of squirrel away a copy of a of deployment uh, uh, document and save it on their laptop um, because it can go out of date and then you have a problem there as well. Uh, so make sure that um, you, you, uh, you know, help socialize it and, and make it effective, right? Because just the existence of documentation doesn't know that mean that people are going to read it or use it. And let's see what else. Um, organizational culture. Uh, that's how it becomes part of the culture is if you set that expectation. Uh, also remember to include some training and knowledge transfer sessions. So build and implement a password vault, for example, but make sure that you also onboard the various teams and departments with some actual live training, uh, and then maybe record you know, one of those sessions for people that couldn't make it to the live training. Uh, also try to support, and this is what I'll get into next, also try to support the three different learning styles, the three main learning styles of learning, and to record some of the training to help reduce the time commitment from your team uh, to deliver those onboarding sessions. So what are those main styles again? Visual, right? Uh, delivering the training, graphs, illustrations, videos, pictures, diagrams. Visual learners need to be shown a picture instead of being told a story. Their mind needs to be engaged by images in order to help them acquire the information and to retain it. But remember that pretty much all learners benefit from having visual components to the documentation. Even those who gravitate towards verbal or auditory learning styles appreciate a good data visualization, for example. So seek out good examples from others if you cannot create original content yourself. <clears throat> Shown here, Shown here are scans from a 2003 article entitled Playing Piano in the Mind, an fMRI study on musical or music imagery and performance in pianists. And so you can see basically different parts of the brain lighting up uh, while someone is playing piano. 
and it shows that your brain has you know, different sections that are used. You know, um, in the early days, I think of brain science, brain research. Um, people talked about left brain, right brain. Left brain being what uh, mathematical, right brain being creative, and they were on the opposite sides. I think are the hemispheres, and they had experiments where they would find people that had had a separation between the hemispheres of their brains and um, that they would actually suffer from various you know um, communication inabilities where they would see things and understand them uh, but not be able to communicate them and so this sort of um, bi-hemispheric um, pathology studies kind of gave rise to a misunderstanding actually of how the brain works which was oh this is right brain thinking this is left brain thinking uh, but really, those were just brains that had artificially somehow had the communications uh, between them severed. Uh, a normal, average, healthy brain uh, has all sorts of mathematical and creative activity going on in multiple regions of the brain. And of course, fMRI studies, um, what is it, um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, I think it's called, um, allows us to watch people you know, observing and doing different activities, uh, potentially, so that we can understand, you know, what parts of the brain light up when a person sees, you know, um, their, their, their pet dog, for example, uh, versus when they see something like, you know, a cockroach or something. And you can, you know, gauge emotions and engagement uh, by measuring these things and understanding them better. And I think that's also true for visual training, right? So that's why I like to have at least pretty much on every slide of every deck for this whole course, you know, has some visual element for your brain to latch on to while I'm discussing and, and delivering some of the content. It actually helps you to pack the learning and the information into that image that you're seeing. <clears throat> In terms of uh, verbal style, uh, this would be group discussions, uh, podcasts, uh, articles, one-on-one -on -one conversations. This learning style includes both the written word, the most common format for documentation, uh, but also the spoken word. So if you prefer this style, you actually find it easy to write or speak about a subject as a means of expressing yourself. Not everyone, however, prefers this style. And so your documentation and training should include the other styles in order to reach the widest audience and to have the deepest effect and impact. And now lastly, the third, um, kinesthetic, uh, having to do with tactile uh, manipulatives. Um, so examples of this would be walking meetings. Uh, Steve Jobs was quite famous for having walking meetings with his direct reports uh, for his one-on-ones. And it uh, helps actually a lot with the power dynamic of working with a direct report uh, or working with your boss. If you're walking someone together and just walking around the campus and having a conversation and talking about your challenges, it, it forces you to not be based on, you know, um, a list of, of questions that you might have. It forces you to sort of focus on the core essential challenges that you're facing um, and blockers, because that's a good use for a one-on-one -on -one time. And anyway, so walking meetings can be quite uh, successfully deployed um, as a management technique. And uh, you can also have role playing, uh, where someone pretends to be a customer and you're trying to sell, you know, if you're in a sales role, uh, you can do active role playing uh, to figure out how to get past maybe some of their resistance uh, to wanting to take a demo or to purchase the product. And so role playing can be a helpful way of acting out, um, you know, information, documentation, training, and, uh, you know, sales techniques. Uh, note taking actually is also a form of kinesthetic. If you're working with a piece of paper and a notebook. And I know a lot of people do this in the digital era because there's something, I guess you might call it um, fundamentally well paced, um, the tempo at which it happens. When you write words with a pen or pencil in a notebook, it might be a moleskin, it could just be a loose leaf sheet of paper. I often keep a drawer full of blank um, copy paper from copies that I didn't need. Um, or that were the wrong document. And so I just used the back side of them. And right now I have a stack of actually manuscripts of uh, music because uh, I printed some, some sheet music for my daughter uh, for her piano. Um, she's performing in a, uh, a competition, the Princeton um, Piano uh, Festival. And so I had a bunch of extra paper and it's just kind of fun having scratch paper around uh, that has, you know, uh, manuscript and Bach and Beethoven uh, sheet music on the other side. And so I'll take some notes and I, of course, keep reams and reams of digital notes and documentation. Uh, but sometimes there's just something well typed because you can actually type faster than you can think. And uh, for me, at least, um, the speed of thought 
is much more better timed with um, contemplative speed of writing and thinking uh, on a piece of paper. I'll often fold it in half and, and make lists and notes and diagrams and things just to sort of flush out the original uh, thoughts and then maybe convert it to digital later. Uh, and then, of course, any hands on activities like fidget spinners um, or puzzles. Um, here you see a picture of a, a manipulative um, that's being used, you know, in a grade school setting, for example. Um, children have an innate understanding of how to balance things and architecture. And oftentimes they actually lose that fundamental understanding uh, over time, which is a strange defect, actually, of the education system. You would think it would only make them better at it over time. But sometimes we're a better learner um, the younger we are. Uh, our minds are more pliable, uh, more plastic, plasticity, uh, and uh, more open to thinking about things in, in creative ways. Um, kinesthetic learning is also referred to as tactile learning. Kinesthetic learners like to have, as I mentioned, manipulatives and to participate in the activity rather than listening to a lecture or watching a demonstration. Unfortunately, I can't do that over Zoom um, unless I spent send you a bunch of fidget spinners or you know blocks um, for you to play with. Uh, but um, anyway, assignments uh, are an example of one way to bridge this gap uh, from theory and practice, right? Because you get engaged in doing the assignment, uh, whether it's uh, digital or, or on, um, on pencil and paper. To craft an assignment, um, which delivers firsthand knowledge and experience of a process or a tool or a concept is a very valuable endeavor. Uh, I'd like to refer to the word praxis at this point, uh, P-R-A-X-I-S. And if you haven't heard it before, it's a term that's used to describe sort of the combination of theory and practice in building a stronger relationship for the learner. Uh, solving puzzles, like I said, having fidget spinners on a desk you know, during a team meeting um, are ways to engage the cognitive skills as part of the support of kinesthetic learning. So you're not necessarily taking someone's OCD and making them zone out while they're playing with a fidget spinner or one of those boxes that has switches and triggers and, you know, uh, on all six sides. Um, you're actually helping occupy that part of the brain so that they can actually digest and ingest um, information uh, more successfully. Documentation standards. <clears throat> Standardized documents have a consistent appearance, structure, and quality, and should therefore be easier to read and understand. Um, if you can have a style guide, right, for a website, you can certainly have a style guide for documentation. That makes it easier for people to consume it if you have templates uh, and use standard set of fonts, um, different types of heading styles and weight uh, of those. And it's important to establish those so that people don't kind of get, get caught up in differences in documentation styles uh, and, and typography and things like that. Uh, shown here is a scene from the 1999 movie Office Space. Uh, in which TPS reports feature as a comedic reference to the mundane and dreary aspect of documentation. But documentation does not need to be a burden. Uh, when asked, the director of the film, Mike Judge, explained that TPS stands for Test Program Set, uh, describing the step-by-step -step process in which an engineer tests and retests software or an electronics system. Uh, and so if you haven't seen the movie, um, <clears throat> office space. Uh, it is a great classic. Um, hilarious scenes and references in it. Great music um, and awesome uh, you know, performances delivered by the, the, the actors in the film. Here you have this schmarmy kind of CEO type who's talking to someone saying, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to come in on Saturday. Uh, or they're asking this guy to go work in the basement uh, who has a red stapler. Anyway, lots of fun memes and cultural references in the film to be aware of. All right, so now why, we're done with why document. Let's talk about what to document. Meeting minutes, JIRA tickets, release notes, Git commits, wiki pages. Think of documentation as leaving behind some breadcrumbs for you or for someone else to find and make their way home safely, as in make their way to the information they're looking for. But there are stronger reasons to document. Uh, meeting minutes can be relied upon to capture discussions, action items, and decisions taken. Without the meeting minutes, it's possible for someone to forget, or selectively or genuinely, um, what they discussed or agreed. So I often uh, create meeting minutes in real time on screen during the meeting. And it kind of takes me out of the equation a little bit. And uh, that's useful in certain circumstances. 
Um, but it makes sure that everyone sees what's being written uh, during the meeting. Because uh, if you do it afterwards, um, there can be, you know, kind of failure to agree, I guess, uh, on what the salient point was or how to state uh, a particular observation that someone made. And so if you're minuting the meeting in real time, uh, they have a chance to correct it and say, no, no, I didn't mean you know that, I meant this. And then they have you change a word you know, or a word that you thought you heard or misheard. And so although it takes, um, you know, slows down the meeting a little bit sometimes because then everyone can't be talking and brainstorming, that's actually a good thing. Uh, it can cause for you know more reflective um, you know group work uh, if you have to wait a minute for someone to kind of type it up and add some bullets and you know change and fix a typo and you should try to get over the nervousness that comes naturally from minuting a meeting in real time uh, in front of your colleagues or in front of your boss uh, or in front of a customer even well, but anyway it's a technique that I find uh, particularly helpful uh, and of course you know to make it um, uncontestable later. Uh, that it was discussed because it's searchable, right? You have these meeting minutes. And on a typical wiki uh, or other type of internal documentation tool, uh, you can use templates, right? And so it can already have a list of, you know, for date and time and location and attendees and uh, agenda and discussion points and a section with radio boxes for action items and decisions taken. And that can also make things more efficient as well. Uh, standardizing, like I said, the documentation. Uh, let's see, I used, uh, I think I used this, yeah, I used this image in week three's lecture about data classification. Uh, and it bears repeating this week as well. Communication artifacts are documentation. And there are many different kinds of communication artifacts uh, and are in, many of them are close to the actual software and our development processes, um, release and deployment systems and other tools. Some are more verbose than others, and that's on the axis here, verbosity on the right and, and less uh, verbose uh, on the left, uh, which might be called terse, um, and is called terse. And uh, let's see, uh, but even terse forms need to preserve intent and to, uh, in order to be useful, and you certainly don't want them to be empty. Uh, so some of these items on the left, uh, stand-up meetings, yeah, uh, timesheet, invoice notes, uh, agendas. I really hate it when people have meetings uh, and, and don't even put an agenda together. So you can't even tell whether you should go to the meeting. And that contributes to a lot of people wasting a lot of time going to meetings that could have been solved in an email uh, or didn't even need them to participate. So I feel like I have the permission to not attend a meeting um, solely on the fact of, of whether or not uh, it lacks an agenda. Um, what else? Um, uh, log messages, uh, extracting methods, naming things, you know, all of these are terse, but they can still be, have meaning in them. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, blah, blah, terse forms, intent, um, commit messages. Uh, so if you're doing a git commit and you have a reasonably detailed description in your git commit, that's an important instinct to encourage in yourself, in your own code commits, and in your teams. Um, you can even put a <clears throat> post git commit hook, which won't let the git commit um, be accepted unless you put in, say, a JIRA ticket reference, right, where you have like a three-letter project code dash and then, you know, um, a series of digits. You can actually put a regex into the um, git commits and say, okay, well, if you're committing a code change, it better be tied to a ticket. And that ticket better have documentation in it as to what changed and why and how was it tested and what are the artifacts that were um, collected during the testing. So anyway, post commit hooks um, at the very least uh, for git commits. Uh, pull and merge request comments, right? They ought to make it reasonably um, um, you know, an intelligible to the casual reader. Uh, what is the merge request you know, and uh, why you know, is it being uh, merged? Uh, what is the, the work that went into it? Uh, readme files. These are often uh, overlooked. Um, these leave behind breadcrumbs for the next owners of the platform and for the code, because we're not going to work in the same company. Um, it's certainly not these days, you know, for our entire lives. And so I often will add, for example, to a spreadsheet, um, a readme tab, and I'll just type in, you know, who created it uh, in case that metadata gets lost or, or misunderstood or someone copies the spreadsheet later. Uh, the readme file, you can also put in a hyperlink 
back to a wiki page. And so you're linking this in intra links, you know, and cross linking your documentation, making it easier for someone to sort of find the spreadsheet in a Google sheet, uh, or an Excel spreadsheet, and then find, you know, the ticket or the project homepage that talks about why this artifact was created, what kind of data is in there, who are the owners, you know, the project um, that it was related to. Anyway, so readme files um, also apply to making a readme tab in a worksheet. And that way you can put like a legend and you can put information that people may have questions about the data and make it much more self-sufficient uh, for them to consume you know, the information in that uh, spreadsheet. Uh, and of course, Wiki, you know, I've probably mentioned it enough now that you realize that I think that's one of the mainstays of documentation uh, and to inspire the habit with others. And of course, logging. Uh, logging is often overlooked as well. A lot of people don't believe that logging needs to be enabled. Um, or standardized, and that just leads to a paucity of context uh, when things break uh, or when you're doing an incident response and an investigation. So InfoSec has a vested interest in making sure everyone's logging uh, and that they're logging critical warning, error, and info, uh, and to have various standards for, for timestamps and whether they include GMT offsets in the timestamp so you know whether the server is in a particular geography or not if certain events happened at the same time or around the same time when you're doing troubleshooting or like I said, incident response. Uh, Swagger, uh, here is a reasonable point to inject something about API documentation. Uh, open source, Swagger is an open source software framework backed by tools uh, that helps developers design, build, document, and consume restful web interfaces and web services. Uh, it includes support for automated documentation, code generation, and test case generation. So Swagger is great. Uh, when creating APIs, Swagger tooling may be used to automatically generate an open API document based on the actual code itself. And that helps maintain the freshness of the documentation. Uh, this embeds essentially the API description uh, in the source code of a project and is informally called code first or bottom up API development. I uh, couldn't certainly could never talk uh, about documentation and design uh, without mentioning PRINCE2. Uh, PRINCE2 is actually a bit of an acronym. The P and the R comes from projects, and then the IN comes from IN, uh, and then the C is controlled, and the E is environments. Uh, it's a structured project management method and practitioner certification program. So it's adopted in many countries worldwide, including the UK, Western European countries, and Australia. Prince2 Agile is an extension to the original Prince2, which was much more sort of waterfall-based um, development, where you could have a project you know, running for six months, 12 months, you know, two years, um, and finally reach its release at the end of a two-year development cycle. And so it doesn't really fit to the modern you know, release every two weeks kind of thing. Uh, but Prince2 uh, has been adapted um, to help, um, and it can be utilized and deployed with agile behaviors, frameworks, and uh, additional techniques. PRINCE2 has become increasingly popular and is now a de facto standard for many project management um, in many UK government departments and uh, across the entire United Nations uh, system. PRINCE2 specifies a series of project management documents called products. Each PRINCE2 process and theme are mapped to the documents which are used to carry out that process. The documents, aka the products, are core to the methodology. <coughs> I worked with Prince2 um, as a methodology in a project management for the first time when I was designing Rabobank's trading floor back in 2012, uh, living in Europe. And um, Rabobank is a Dutch um, agrarian bank. It actually started as a bunch of farmers that met in someone's living room. And it's a very long running conservative bank. It survived the 2008 financial crisis without taking any kind of bailouts or loans because they were inherently conservative with their investments and how they built their, their banking infrastructure. Uh, and so <clears throat> while it was actually a little bit frustrating at first to begin with 26 documents uh, and to try to get them all finalized and approved before we could actually begin the project, right? None of, it, it wasn't an agile um, uh, approach that we used for building this trading floor. Uh, and it was a once in 30 year kind of project. Um, they don't design and build trading floors, you know, um, that often. 
uh, and it was the flagship trading floor for Rabobank in their Utrecht um, office. But if it were not for the documentation, um, then it was not going to not going to happen. Um, and if it was not in the documentation, it just it wasn't going to happen at all on the project. And this is an important um, aspect, right? Um, the most important document, the one which you can bring to other situations without taking all of Prince 2 with you, is what I call the PID. Um, and that's one of the you know, 26 standard Prince 2 documents. PID stands for Project Initiation Document. Uh, and so when you have that, right, this is the plan that if everyone agrees to it, that can help keep the project on track. Uh, you may have heard of scope creep, for example. As some projects going along, someone gets a clever idea and says, "Hey, why don't we, um, you know, build a database instead of use flat files?" And if it wasn't in the original PID, and if it wasn't in the original design and documentation, uh, then you can just say, "Sorry, at scope creep, you know, if you want to make a change to the documentation and to the project, you have to actually put in a change request uh, to revise the the." the documentation and the products um, of Prince2. And you can think of this maybe a little bit bureaucratic, but it's actually a protection mechanism uh, for any project that you're engaged with uh, that is being run in a Prince2 fashion. Uh, you can use that, like I said, to stop scope creep from derailing uh, and uh, causing the project to be late uh, or delayed due to scope creep. Uh, and this is um, some of the parts of a PID. So each document, of course, is, is um, excruciatingly detailed um, into what it contains. <coughs> so you contain a project definition. Uh, the PID also contains a project approach. Uh, it contains the business case. Um, and many times you'd find actually startups and companies working on projects that don't even have a business case. They think, oh, we, we have to do this. You know? And if you don't document it, you could well be wasting everyone's time working on something that the business doesn't even need. Um, it also, uh, the PID also includes the project management team structure, uh, role descriptions, uh, which is very important for a RACI model and for everyone to know what everyone's uh, responsibilities are. Uh, the PID also includes a quality management approach, uh, QA, right? And um, people actually have to QA the documentation and QA the diagrams and then sign off and approve on them. That's all part of Prince 2 as well. And one of the things that's useful, I guess, is that People sometimes forget to do QA. And so there's all sorts of defects and bugs that end up in you know, just-in-time, rapid, agile development and programming. So prints can help inform, even when used in an agile way, uh, the application of standards of quality control. Uh, of course, you have aspects of change control uh, that need to be documented. How do you make changes to what you intended to do? Because prints, too, doesn't just mean you, you decide what you're going to do and then never change it. You definitely have to take feedback and, and real-time changes or challenges that come up uh, with your design or your implementation of something. Uh, there's also a risk management uh, approach that's embedded into the core of the PID, uh, which is you need to have a risk log for the project. And you need to review that risk log periodically. And you need to know who is going to review the risk log. And that way, you can potentially identify you know, showstoppers and um, complete failures to plan uh, by having a risk management approach embedded in the methodology, in the PID. Uh, and also a communication management approach. How do you communicate that the project's happening and the milestones and to make sure everyone stays up to date? Who are the stakeholders that need to be included in that communication plan? Uh, Prince2 forces you to do all of this thinking upfront and ahead of time. And it may feel a little bit stilted and overly formal, but believe me, it, it helps um, to keep a project and its delivery and expectations uh, on track. Uh, and then, of course, finally, the PID includes the actual project plan, uh, project controls, and then there's aspects of, of tailoring of Prince2 uh, for your specific industry or, or project type. All right, so let me shift uh, the focus a little bit now and say you know something about storytelling. So every culture has its own stories or narratives which are shared as a means of entertainment, education, cultural preservation, and instilling of, of values. Documentation is a culture-bearing artifact, or at least it can be if it's well done. So good ideas live and die based on your ability to communicate, to tell the story of what you're doing for your project or your company in such a way as to carry the narrative <clears throat> from the present into the future and to infect your team with the ability to collaborate, uh, to the ability to execute, and the ability to solve real business problems. 
uh, be they security related or not, crafting a good story is part and parcel of creating good documentation. Uh, the shape of stories. Uh, the basic shape of stories is there's an inciting incident, a struggle or failure, uh, the climax, and a resolution. That's the basic shape, right? It's like an archetype template. Uh, there could be multiple struggles or failures along the way, um, different aspects that we call complication of plot. For example, if you're watching an episodic television show, um, there will be several complications of plot before resolution at the end of the show, or at least partial resolution if it's a to be continued kind of thing. And of course, these story arcs, you know, can span multiple episodes and multiple years. Um, Marvel's Endgame was the culmination of, you know, um, 22 films and 10 years of storytelling. Uh, and that was just one story arc that was begun, you know, and reflected from things that happened in the comics that made its way onto the screen. I think that's why Endgame and um, Infinity War had such an uh, uh, incredible impact on people because they had been brought by, brought along by all the trilogies leading up to it, right? The trio of Iron Man films, uh, the Thor films, um, Doctor Strange, who will be having, I think, a second film soon. But getting back to information security, for the purposes of information security and any other business or group or team, the incentive is the objective or, no, sorry, the incident, right? We talked about, you know, the inciting incident. The incident is the objective or problem to be addressed. What is the job to be done? How can the team utilize their knowledge of the problem? The climax reveals the idea or the insight or the process or the product. Uh, that has to be selected or that has to be developed if it doesn't exist yet. Uh, you need to engage the audience for your documentation and your storytelling by showing the struggle leading up to the idea. You can't just open up with the big idea and expect people to appreciate its meaning or its significance. And the climax, of course, makes sure that the reader understands not only what your team did or plans to do, but why. The why is, is quite important, actually, not just how and, and uh, when or what. Uh, and lastly, the resolution is delivered and the options uh, are, are conveyed. Uh, I took this graph, um, this graphic out of a uh, friend of mine's book. Um, she was a former colleague that worked with me at Organic. She wrote this really great book on um, collaboration. And I should probably put the link uh, into an announcement uh, so that you can read it because it's really well written. And she, of course, took this from, you know, a standing piece of knowledge and literature about uh, the nature of stories. Uh, there are four storylines, essentially, four archetypes for stories, and everything is just a variation on them, each with a different job to be done in the world of storytelling and in the world of documentation and information security. There's the report, keeping the stakeholders informed and confident. There's no big reveal just a few bullets, a few ahas uh, that are kept brief, kind of like a daily newscast, right? Um, it's not like a major groundbreaking news kind of story. It's just your daily news story. What's gonna be the temperature? You know, what's the traffic report like? The next um, archetype is called the pitch. Here you're creating buy-in by grounding the reader or the listener in the pain points and speaking to the future uh, or a recommendation. So in the pitch, it's a pretty simple lift, right? You go over the hurdle, you explain what those pay points are, and you raise up, right? That last arrow, that last red arrow next to each one of these shows you how far of a journey you take the listener or the reader uh, from their original understanding and perspective to some other place. And so obviously the report has a small lift, a small delta, um, and the pitch you know, has a quite large one. Uh, the next form is called the explanation. It's a very common form, but it's often botched. Uh, it's often you know, messed up. Uh, an expert droning on in slide after slide with no images um, you know, and not um, you know, asking questions or, or pausing for people to think about what's been said. Uh, and so the, one of the things that helps here is obviously inserting diagrams and images. Uh, this can help put you know, the explanation you know, into context. And essentially you're starting at a base level of understanding and you ratchet up and you ratchet up and eventually you hope to reach them to the same conclusion that you have, right? And this is the bit I was talking about. Um, you can't just open with the top of the step ladder there for the explanation, right? You have to build up to it. And with the pitch, you have to kind of take them on a journey. 
And then lastly, there's the form called the drama. The most common uh, form outside of work, uh, it, drama is best used when you need to reset the empathy level of the audience. The harsh reality needs to be felt and not just described. Uh, a current or future danger has to be made real and palpable for the audience in order to inspire the action or actions that are needed to solve the problem. So think of, um, you know, uh, what would be an example, uh, Ralph Nader's, um, you know, famous, um, I think it was a book or maybe article, uh, un Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, and talking about the era of automobile uh, safety before the uh, introduction of uh, seatbelts. And uh, the idea here is that you're really trying to change a fundamental assumption that the business has, right? The board of directors or, you know, the project you know, team that you have to win over uh, with this particular type of storytelling. And that's why you actually have to dip down below their current level of happiness and show them the pain and have them feel that pain and live in it and get uncomfortable with a few minutes uh, or, you know, for part of the presentation. And then you have this exalted rise up, you know, out of the drama. And then you take them on that final journey. So the total distance traveled is much greater because you've had to take them down first and help them experience the fact that we're just not solving the, you know, the problem um, with, with HIV and AIDS or with cancer research or, or um, you know, malnutrition or lack of clean water. And so you really have to let people feel that, um, you know, that hurt uh, in order to get them to say, you're right, you know, we need to change the way we're doing this. We need to question our assumptions. And it could be a fundamental business assumption. It could say that, you know, IBM, we're going to get out of the business of making laptops and we're going to sell off, you know, the entire laptop business to Lenovo. That was the kind of pitch that had to be made to the executives at IBM and said the future of the company is not in making laptops. It has to be in artificial intelligence and Watson and security services and cloud and managed infrastructure and, and things like that. All right, so it is now 420. I'm on slide 21. I think we're going at a good tempo. Uh, let's talk about diagrams. Uh, it's an aspect of documentation, of course. And uh, I like to require three kinds of diagrams to support the healthy integration of information security into an organization. A high level design diagram, a system diagram, and a data flow diagram. So let's take a look at each. The high level diagram. This is an architectural overview and it's essentially a logical representation. So if you're going to have a database, you're just going to have one, even though it may be a cluster of servers or, um, you know, a uh, primary with several read only replicas and secondaries. Uh, in the high level diagram, you would just represent it as one database. Uh, so there's logical view, not system. The system diagram is the one that shows the discrete systems in context. And a system diagram could well be, you know, like, um, a layer three diagram, right? A network diagram that shows this is a web server, it's behind a load balancer, there's three web servers or n number of web servers if it's an auto scaling group. And um, the system diagram is where you would potentially show the connectivity between various tools and components, right? That are represented only logically in the high level diagram. And then the data flow diagram. This is the third one that I like to require all of my projects and uh, teams to, to build. I use it obviously for architectural security and application security reviews, uh, threat modeling, but it's also useful for incident response. So when something goes wrong, it's really great to have a high level diagram and say so, someone can point to that diagram and say, this is the thing that's broken or this is the thing that just got compromised. And it can get everyone onto the same page and troubleshooting and responding much more quickly uh, than without a diagram. Uh, it helps orient people to the problem. Uh, the data flow diagram represents obviously the flow of data in a system or process. And since the universe at these point uh, is quite data centric and data is the new gold, right, that we talked about um, on the internet and information and data is the main thing, the crown jewels that we're often protecting is just data. If you don't have a data flow diagram, you don't know what data lives where, you don't know what kind of systems need multi-factor auth or additional, you know, um, auditing and uh, monitoring. Uh, there are, of course, many other types of diagrams, uh, including entity relationship diagrams, ERDs, um, activity diagrams, object diagrams, deployment diagrams, component diagrams. But in my estimation, having just these three will usually suffice to provide sufficient understanding of a system, a platform, 
an application or a service. So what does a high level diagram look like? Well, I have a lovely example for you here. Uh, the high level diagram is an architectural overview. It should include the major components and interfaces for the product. Uh, a good HLD, uh, an acronym for high level diagram, should be able to explain what the product is and what it is comprised of in a fairly abstract manner. Shown here is a high level diagram for Instagram. Uh, it contains only the logical components of the system or platform. So like I said, a database with Instagram posts, for example, is shown here as one 3D cylinder, though in the system diagram, it might actually be um, a master or slave or perhaps two mirrored hot, hot database servers, right? The actual media images for the Instagram posts is a discrete and separate database logically in this diagram. Uh, and I found this on the internet. Um, this is not uh, confidential or sensitive information. But essentially, this is a really good high level diagram for what is, I'm sure, under the hood, a very complicated platform, right, for Instagram. Uh, next up, um, oh wait, no, this is a high level diagram that I created, actually. Uh, I created this for an organization called uh, EDSN, Energy Data Services Nederland. Uh, so I did this when I was working in Europe in, uh, I think, 2013 or so. I would have to trust that my design has since been modified and that this is now only a reference design. Uh, EDSN develops and operates the Dutch Energy Data Hub on behalf of the Dutch transmission and distribution system operators, the Dutch grid, right? Kind of like we have the uh, ISO, the Northeastern ISO uh, for the US, which is the grid for the, you know, for this part of the country. And Texas had their own um, grid, right? Because they wanted to be separate. Uh, and so they would have a similar kind of diagram potentially as well uh, for their data hub and data sharing about uh, transmission and distribution systems for, for electricity. Uh, the purpose of EDSN was to ensure optimal functioning of the Dutch energy market uh, in transition through uniform communication methods, transparent market processes and secure data access. So as the smart grid started to get rolled out in Europe, uh, EDSN was important uh, and so this shows uh, what I put the internet in the middle, although typically in diagrams, you know, the internet goes at the top and then everything is down below and you have what's called north south traffic, uh, which is from a DMZ and the internet towards more, you know, selectively uh, restrictive um, higher end back end systems. And then east west traffic, which is thought of as lateral movement within this platform of systems. Um, but I was playing around with this back then you know, to kind of make it clear that you know you had Alsmer, which is one data center, and then Harlem, which was another data center on the bottom. And you had certain visual um, observations, right? That anyone uh, coming up to look at this diagram could sort of dwell on it and, and look at it and start to figure, okay, it looks like there's some red and green redundant switches up in Alsmer on the EDSN network. There's one gigabit connection over to the LPC network. Uh, the LPC is, um, uh, uh, an acronym for a logical um, processor config or something like that, if I remember correctly. And you had your storage area network and you had different config environments and those were all hooked up to redundant switches. And so this is a high level diagram that's showing a little bit of the redundancy, uh, but not 100% of what would be shown in a system diagram. Uh, and then you have you know, redundant 10 gig fiber between you know, two of the data centers. And then you have a couple of five megabit connections and some 45 megabit connections uh, for redundancy between, like I said, each of the two environments. And they're not completely identical matches of each other. And anyway, so drawing this diagram was something that I did uh, that I think is useful. And a lot of times architects don't do this, um, but I think they should. Um, here is the storage high level diagram for that same uh, infrastructure and now I'm doing left and right so I'm messing with some of the standards and you know, design language for the documentation, but it kind of lends itself to this format because of the nature of the connections. Uh, so here I tried to visualize <coughs> some of the more convoluted storage paths and to make them look like a subway map essentially. Uh, and uh, let's see, NetApp storage appliances are in each of these two data centers. These were actually the legacy storage solution, um, having been purchased in, I think, 2007. And then the EMC SAN, the storage area network appliances, these were the ones that were introduced a, a year before in 2012. And so I wanted to be able to communicate, you know, the migration path um, from legacy storage to production storage and some of the complexity that was involved in which systems were attached to which storage, because it wasn't identical, right? It wasn't um, like uh, you know, a perfectly connected snowflake of you know, corners and connections and systems and environments. 
And so this is just a way to you know, capture it in a one pager <clears throat> so that while we're talking about the project, we can talk about the storage and which parts are done and we can kind of show them in a series of diagrams over time. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, now let's talk about system diagrams. So a system diagram defines the boundaries between the system or part of a system and its environment. And it has to have various elements, right? And it's interesting because if you talk to somebody that operates one of those elements, they might think of just that whole element as their whole system, right? Like it could be an advertising network um, platform and it could have multiple elements inside of it itself. But if you zoom out far enough from another point of view, if you're not the ad network company, but you're the business that's using an ad network platform, you might collapse that entire diagram into just one element in a system diagram. Uh, and uh, it should show some of the entities that interact with it. So here, you know, a, a typical layer three network diagram is my favorite kind of system diagram, as I mentioned, uh, but not all organizations are staffed to provide these for their infrastructure. Uh, it can be created by architects uh, or it can be created by network admins. Uh, the key item in the system that it delivers is the port and protocol connectivity between the systems. So for InfoSec, this is an essential view of the systems and their interfaces because it reveals the attack surface of the platform or the service. And so what do we have here? Um, this one looks like a um, basic, what, um, uh, uh, dual data center um, design where you have an elastic load balancer in each uh, and then you have um, uh, availability zone 1A and 1B on the left, that could be US West, for example. And then on the right, you have um, the same kind of infrastructure perfectly mirrored uh, in availability zone 1A and 1B and perhaps US East. And that way, this is just sort of a high level reference diagram of a system diagram. And you could show, you know, and maybe write in on the lines connecting them what's port 443 using HTTPS, what's using port 80 for a regular web service, uh, what's using port 22 for SSH connections and con connectivity, uh, what might be a storage mount connection or a database connection over port 1521 for Oracle uh, or 1433 uh, for Microsoft SQL servers, things like that. Uh, a couple of more system diagram examples. Here's one of the production environment systems, um, and this was named uh, config one. Uh, and this is a logical environment that was hosted on a set of shared production servers, uh, config one. So this particular diagram was made with PowerPoint. So you don't necessarily need a licensed and expensive copy of Microsoft Visio uh, to create diagrams. And so what was interesting is that we had multiple logical environments running on one set of production hardware. And so we actually had like a non-production instance on the production hardware that could be used um, and they were had logically discrete uh, or logically separated infrastructure. And so you can see this one's much more like I discussed at first, right? The internet would be up at the top. You have a load balancer, a web layer, an application layer that has your business logic. Below that, you have like a replication store and then a database. And then underlying all that is your storage layer. And then on the very back end, you enumerate a whole bunch of your administrative layer, your management layer for monitoring, NTP servers, DNS servers, email servers for SMTP and things like that. So I think this was um, a release four um, of where we were getting with the infrastructure and fault tolerance as we're building it up. Uh, next up, as you can see, um, <coughs> the four new ADC servers <clears throat> they show a different architectural approach to providing the service, Elim eliminating essentially the fault tolerance on the web layer and reporting layers and having you talk directly to the app layer, um, but maintaining fault tolerance within the database layer. Uh, and so this is one way of explaining and visualizing, you know, uh, additional infrastructure coming in and, and how it differs uh, to the production uh, that was there before. Um, moving on, uh, data flow. So a DFD or a data flow diagram provides information about the outputs and inputs of each entity <clears throat> and the process itself. So the DFD naturally leads to a discussion about threat modeling. Uh, and now that we have uh, the HLD, right, the high level diagram, we know what logical entities are included in the platform or service delivery. And the system diagram has exposed the attack surface and the attack vectors for the systems themselves. Uh, then we just need to think about how the data moves within the platform. So shown here is a DFD for a university enrollment process. Uh, this one uh, is not NYU's process, um, just to be clear uh, as an FYI. 
Um, so if you'll excuse me a minute, I'm going to have to pause the share. Um, and um, step away for a minute for a quick uh, bio break. Um, so let me uh, mute and stop the video for a second. Hang on. Um, let's see, I probably should have actually paused the recording there uh, to avoid people having to <clears throat> fast forward uh, to get back into the deck, uh, but I didn't think of that at the moment. All right, so here we are back into the share. You should be seeing the presentation mode of the data flow diagram for a university enrollment process, which shows, you know, collecting fees at the registrar student information going into a student database, um, schedule and enrollments going into what they call D2 here for the, um, what is it, the seminar schedule perhaps. Uh, anyway, so these are the kinds of things that would be in a data flow diagram. It doesn't have to be drawn with a drawing tool, although that helps uh, if you want it to be maintainable in the future. Uh, there's different tools that you can use like Lucidchart that integrate with um, wikis that are less expensive than uh, using Microsoft Visio. Or as I mentioned, you can use open source um, you know, tools like Google Slides or, or Microsoft PowerPoint, um, which is commercial, but uh, allows you to you know, create some basic diagrams as well. All right, moving on. Additional documentation types. Uh, FAQs, right? Frequently asked questions, uh, how-to articles, uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, uh, roadmap documents, project plans, uh, RCA, uh, root cause analysis uh, documents, um, PIDs, as I mentioned, for PRINCE2, project initiation documents, 
uh, creative briefs. You know, there's all sorts of um, other uh, things, you know, like run books, for example, as well, and release notes and repositories. So let's talk about these, uh, some of these other documentation types for a little bit as well. Run books. <clears throat> run books are procedural. Uh, wikis are browsable. Uh, release notes, uh, they have to do with updates. And repos have to do with uh, code source, uh, source code. Uh, as mentioned previously, there are many other forms of documentation, but these four make a good basis uh, for us to drill down a little bit. So what's in a run book? Uh, a compilation of routine procedures and operations that the system admin carries out uh, or someone on an SRE or DevOps team. What is a run book? Originally, it would have been a printed document, often bound in a three ring binder. Uh, the modern equivalent takes several forms, while a Microsoft Word document might supplant the actual printed run book. It can be argued that a sufficiently detailed and robust script is actually also a run book, uh, as long as it's com you know, commented and, and has information about uh, uh, what it's doing before it actually does it in the script. Uh, or an orchestration tool with an automated response scenario can also be a run book. Uh, whether the orchestration tools engage automatically or as an attended act, um, it doesn't really matter as much as whether they've been tested regularly and that they're kept up to date. Runbooks can be generalized to cover a range of daily tasks, or they can be highly specialized and limited to a specific task or team performed less frequently. Um, to create a runbook, uh, do a task, record your actions, uh, screenshots, things like that, copy and paste commands, uh, and then publish the raw document and then refine with review by others. Uh, so runbooks are not that hard to make. Um, and if you keep them fairly generic, but detailed enough to be followed, uh, they don't have a lot of maintenance burden, right? Because you don't necessarily have to keep specific commands. You could just use example commands and the people may be able to get the specific commands you know, out of a script or out of a repository, for example. Uh, talking about wikis, uh, a wiki is a knowledge base website on which users collaboratively modify and structure content directly from a web browser. Of all the documentation that needs to come into being, I think the wiki is front and foremost. Why? Well, because it's a gathering effort, actually. Uh, a wiki can support hundreds of authors. Uh, it allows for version control of the pages within the tool itself. And it's usually founded on a self-service model for authorization. So for example, limiting permissions on pages with sensitive information that's not administered centrally, uh, but it's actually a delegated or distributed function. So if you make a wiki page and you want to restrict it to four or five people, you just click on you know, the document restriction. It's usually like a lock, you know, kind of padlock looking icon. And you simply say, not everyone can see this. And then you give read or edit permissions to various people. You don't have to open up a help desk ticket to say, please restrict this page to these users. And it's not like SharePoint where you have lots of convolute convoluted permissions and complicated permissions uh, for maintaining documentation in SharePoint systems. Oftentimes you need two or three systems administrators just to keep track of a SharePoint instance. So I actually prefer um, a lot of the uh, wiki work or Google Docs um, over the Microsoft approach. I just feel it's over-engineered uh, and overly centralized in terms of administration. Uh, and that's speaking from experience. I'm not just talking about how I don't like it. Um, I've actually had to build and maintain an infrastructure with SharePoint, and it was tough to keep you know um, secure and to uh, um, keep it um, and patch it and update it. And uh, you know, anyway, so there are you know multiple tools that can be used. Essentially, I don't want to bias you against uh, Microsoft products. <clears throat> they certainly integrate well with themselves, meaning a company that's based entirely on Word you know, and spreadsheets and, you know, um, other types of Microsoft products, uh, a SharePoint solution might actually be the best integration uh, for that. Uh, but for the rest of us, I think it's more like wikis and Google Docs and, you know, shared and HTML and things like that. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to mention about uh, wikis? 
Oh yeah, the whole self-service model I appreciate right much more. Uh, and al although generally an unstructured source of knowledge in business processes, uh, the fact that a wiki is easily searchable and can be linked to other sources of documentation makes it very powerful, right? Remember I was talking about linking out to a Google Doc or linking out to another site or a file share on a file server uh, and creating those cross you know, platform uh, linkages. Um, so the wiki is the one I think everyone would start with, browse their way and then find the other systems uh, where people document. Whereas the wiki is meant for just this kind of task, right? To, to have lots of smaller tidbits of information. Uh, larger documentation efforts, efforts often find it difficult to assemble and maintain these little tidbits. And that's where I think the wiki hits its uh, sweet spot. It's essentially the democratization of the documentation process itself. And once it reaches critical mass, it begins to fuel its own momentum within the organization. So you have page history within the page. You can say who made what changes and when and uh, you can comment on it, you can pull them back out, you know, uh, you can link to other tools um, like in Confluence and Jira from Atlassian, for example, a very popular wiki um, platform, not just the Wikipedia software that I kind of showed there. Uh, and of course, templates. Um, there's lots of wiki templates that help you get up and running, you know, with your documentation styles. You can brand them, customize them, put logos on them, special colors and fonts if you want, or just use the defaults. Um, I find uh, creating templates uh, is at the core you know, of, of many organizations. So meeting minutes definitely include that template. Uh, Post-mortem uh, for root cause analysis, um, you, there's templates that come out of the box for that. Blog posts where someone just wants to say, hey, if you're interested in this topic, this is where I'm going to be writing kind of personal things, right? And extended form, longer form messaging, not just something that would go out in an email saying, oh yeah, the InfoSec team is rolling out the DLP solution today. For further information, go look at the DLP homepage. And then the person that rolled it out could potentially keeping a blog showing what were the challenges, when did they meet with various stakeholders, how did they figure out what crown jewels the data loss prevention platform is meant you know, to kind of protect. Um, this is all aspects uh, that come from, like I said, uh, working uh, with templates on, on, on a wiki. Uh, you can also have templates for OKRs. Um, OKR is a uh, management um, and objective um, approach. Uh, it stands for objectives and key results. Um, lots of people use OKRs <clears throat> to keep track of um, sort of somewhere between tactical and strategic planning for the quarter, um, usually quarterly based. Uh, you can also have a decision page. And the, uh, the anecdote that I like to mention on the decision page uh, is, <clears throat> let's say you have a particularly uh, politically charged um, project. Uh, where you could be, I don't know, um, decommissioning something, right, and replacing it with something new. And there's lots of strongly held opinions on either side as to how it should be decommissioned, should it just be upgraded, or should it be ripped out and paved over. So what I'll often do as a technique to deal with this kind of potential conflict or difference of opinion is to actually use a decision page, which is a particular template. And it lists who the stakeholders are and who the key decision makers are, what's the status of the decision. And the template also includes a date, right? Target date for when the decision will be taken. And then I'll let everyone add the pros and the cons and the options and comment on them and put in background information, attach supporting documents, you know, from potentially things like Gartner Magic Quadrant, if you're selecting, like one example of a decision page would be selecting a um, mobile device management tool or evaluating whether you wanna replace the current one that you have. And the outcome could be replace or keep or pick one of these three you know, tools that you're selecting. And you make that public. And so it doesn't matter if the person's in the room when it was argued, the arguments have to be documented and the comments and responses are also on the decision page. This keeps people from second guessing the decision a year from now uh, or two years from now. And it helps explain the criteria that went into the decision. Because if you capture what those requirements were and which tool won and why at that time, maybe that changes in a year or two from now or five. And so it's a good basis for allowing an organization to change its mind and to take a decision and say, okay, we want to use a totally different platform now for this because our business has changed uh, or we've matured or we've gotten worse at it and we don't need this Cadillac tool anymore. We just need a Ford truck instead of a Cadillac right, to get from point A to point B. 
Uh, so decision pages, very powerful tool uh, and template. Uh, creative briefs, um, that's another uh, easily templatable aspect and standardized, you know, uh, what is the marketing you know, plan? What are the public relations, you know, objectives for the year? You could put together a creative brief. How-to articles, of course, lend themselves very much to templating. Uh, retrospectives, you know, after you do a project or a sprint and you have the retrospective, and of course roadmaps. And so all of these pop out of Atlassian and other wiki templates uh, pretty easily, or you can make them, uh, and I suggest that you do to standardize the look and feel of the documentation. All right, release notes. Documentation that, that is distributed with software uh, is called release notes, and it maintains a line of communication with your users regarding updates and changes to features, functionality, and setting expectations. So you should have release notes, um, even for internal tools, like an intranet where someone can do a customer lookup you know, on a Salesforce. I think you should publish your own release notes um, so that people learn how to use the tools and how to, lose, how to use them most effectively. <clears throat> client facing release notes <clears throat> are kind of mandatory for most products and services. But I think, you know, I also think about those internal apps, like I mentioned, uh, and make sure to deliver substantive release notes. Uh, neglecting to require and publish release notes for homegrown apps leads to misunderstandings and faulty assumptions and people using the tool incorrectly, potentially, or deriving the wrong information from a data warehouse, for example. Uh, release notes do not need to be terribly long and complicated. A few sentences with a few bullet points will usually suffice. Keep the grade level fairly low with regard to jargon and, and technical depth. Uh, so right towards, you know, like a high school kind of mentality. And you'll include the business team and management uh, in the audience and their expectations of level of detail quite easily if you set it at that right level. Repositories. Uh, Git commits should be configured to require comments. Don't make someone parse the code to determine the scope and the intent of the changes. You can also configure the software repository, like I mentioned, to require a JIRA ticket reference and to reject commits, uh, which are not linked to a feature branch in the software repository or was documented in a software development project. A project's long-term success arises from its maintainability. And so in the case of Git, um, a couple more things are useful. Uh, components of a great Git commit comments, no, sorry, components, um, separate subject from body with a blank line. If you separate that, that just makes the git commit a lot easier to read and understand. Limit the subject line to 50 or so characters. Uh, don't drag on, try to be, you know, good at finding out what's the right level of words and level of description to use uh, in the subject. Capitalize the subject line. Do not end the subject line with a period. Um, use, you know, sentence fragments, essentially. Uh, use the imperative mood in the subject line um, and wrap the body at 72 characters uh, so that it fits nicely on 80 character displays um, and reads cleanly. And then use the body to explain what and why versus the how. So when you're making a git commit, talk about uh, what you've done and why, not how. The how is going to be inside of the code and inside of the software. And you don't have to describe that necessarily too in much detail of the body. You need to explain what is changing and why. Uh, documentation review. Uh, the 3090 rule uh, for feedback that I've found uh, means when you're 30% complete, you need to have someone look at it and look at the outline and look at the flow. Um, you haven't committed too far into the documentation yet. Um, that you can't undo, you know, a, a big gap or fix some kind of logical flow problem, right? And then at the 90% point, uh, at 90% complete, the final draft needs to be given a very detailed look, right? The red lines that you see here on this picture. Uh, and then make sure to actually test the documentation. Uh, hand it to a fresh pair of eyes uh, before final approval and see if it can actually be followed by a user with the average level of permissions and experience that you would expect to execute the, the release note uh, or the SOP or the how-to. Keep in mind that uh, humor is helpful in documentation, or at least I find it to be uh, helpful. So find the right examples and you can make your point easily. Don't always try to invent something. 
spend some time looking around at the good work of others. I use this vintage social network image in my cloud roadmap, actually, for Marvel's executive management team. They liked it. Uh, they liked the whole deck, um, not just this slide, right? Uh, they liked it enough for me to present it at the Disney, uh, at the Disney CISO, uh, at the Information Security Officers Summit uh, at the campus in, uh, in Glendale. Uh, documentation creates a shared vision. And often that shared vision is based on, as I've been trying to explain uh, good storytelling. And that's one of the reasons why I've required your team projects to produce an executive presentation and to deliver it as a video recording as well. Uh, practicing how to deliver a deck is something that nobody should shy away from learning how to do well. And uh, one of the readings I think for this week, um, some of you have already finished uh, the assignment is on the nature of storytelling and how our brains work and how we kind of build connections between things that we observe and things that we see and things that we hear uh, that may not be conscious and may not be entirely intentional. Uh, this little bit of engineering humor is one of my favorites. Uh, and so I'll often create a humor and inspiration page on my wiki and um, ask people to contribute things, right? That's how you build a shared culture and encourage people to document stuff. If you find a funny joke, it's hopefully safe for work. Um, and there are a few variations on this particular theme of the one I'm showing you right now, but overall it shows that there are multiple perspectives on a subject like building a tree swing. When your product is software, the possibility of everyone having their own view of what the thing being developed and tested and deployed is very much higher uh, than with physical goods or products. And each perspective is valid and often completely internally consistent. But as this series of images demonstrates, the final result can vary quite widely based on one's own focus and viewpoint. Good documentation is a means by which to limit the diversity of perspectives and idiosyncratic interpretations of what seem to be clearly captured requirements. Uh, and so in this example, I don't know if you can see the, the details of each panel, but upper left-hand corner is how the customer explained it, right? They want like this really cool three, you know, um, seat um, tree swing. Uh, and then of course, how the project leaders understood it, right? Which is a completely non-functional tree swing that can't swing because it's, you know, right through the trunk. Uh, and then of course, how the business consultant described it. It's like a, you know, an easy chair or a Herman Miller chair on, you know, swinging and there's beautiful light emanating from it how the analyst designed it, uh, which would be they took what the project leader understood and then they tried to make it work, right? By cutting out the trunk and letting the tree swing somehow. So it's kind of hacked together. Uh, and then of course, how the programmer wrote it is the second row um, left side, uh, which is completely non-functional tree swing, but it has all of the components and ingredients. They're just not put together correctly. Uh, and then of course, how the project was documented one of the reasons why I include this humor in this week's discussion, no documentation of anything, right? You don't even see the tree or the swing. Uh, what operations installed, <laughs> right? This is just one rope, uh, how it performed under load, right? The butterfly sat on it and it broke, um, it wasn't tested. How it was supported, which it wasn't, it was just chopped down. What the marketing advertised, right? Which is all swing and no tree. Uh, how the customer was billed, right, which is like a fantastic roller coaster ride of um, amazingness, and what the customer actually needed was maybe they didn't need what they thought or explained, right? They just needed a tire hanging from one branch instead of, you know, a bench or a plank you know, or a chair uh, hanging from from you know two parts of the branch um, to spend uh, the person swinging. Anyway, so humor, documentation, humor, always a good uh, icebreaker. All right, so um, threat modeling. <clears throat> threat modeling is a process by which potential threats, uh, such as structural vulnerabilities or the absence of appropriate safeguards, can be identified, enumerated, and mitigations can be prioritized. Uh, so let's talk about threat modeling and the different, some different uh, approaches to threat modeling. STRIDE. Uh, STRIDE is an acronym for spoofing identity. Uh, tampering with data, uh, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So Stride is a model of threats developed by um, Prerit Garg and Lauren Kohnfelder at Microsoft for identifying computer security threats. And it provides a monomic for security threats across these six categories, S-T-R-I-D-N-E. 
And uh, this is a certainly valid framework for someone to apply. It doesn't apply only to Microsoft products. And I think I have an example of, of the stride threat modeling in here in a bit as well. So stride, um, you have desired properties to mitigate threats, right? Uh, so to mitigate the threat of identity spoofing, you have authenticity, right? And authentic authentication and authorization uh, to mitigate the aspect of tampering with data, you have tools and techniques for data integrity. Uh, and of course, repudiation, you meet repudiation with non reputability, um, your auth uh, and uh, authorization and authentication technique should make it pretty hard for someone to share credentials, right? Because that would be repudiation, you could repudiate the claim that you logged in and, and dropped the tables on the database and, and crashed, you know, the whole website or application process. Uh, if you can show that, you know, that there's no way that someone you know, was able to log in as you, if it wasn't you using your token, your user ID, you know, your, um, your password, things like that. Um, challenges to information disclosure uh, are met with confidentiality, of course, confidentiality controls, encryption, things like that. Um, denial of service, uh, that's, of course, met and remediated by having high availability and HA designs, fault tolerant designs. And of course, elevation of privilege as an attack um, aspect for threat modeling uh, is, of course, met with adequate controls for Auth Z uh, authorization. So let's take a quick example from Microsoft's documentation for, Spra uh, for Stride threats in their what's called their commerce server. So this is from several years ago, if I remember correctly. I'm I think 2009, yeah. Uh, this is a view that they published on their website uh, for Microsoft's commerce server. And the figure shows how the, uh, the stride threats in a commerce server installation and the mitigation techniques for each threat. So for example, the threats to the administration database are tampering with data, information disclosure, denial of service. To mitigate these threats, you use access control logs and lists uh, secure socket layer or now TLS um, uh, and uh, IPsec uh, for authentication. Uh, so this is one way to show how um, threat modeling works. So threat modeling is looking at a high level diagram, a data flow diagram and figuring out if I were a bad guy, how would I attack this, right? Where would I take over someone's session? How could I access sensitive data from an unprivileged user and you know uh, escalate privilege and level up on what systems could that happen? And so it's really the InfoSec person sitting down with the developers and the engineers and the architect and walking through you know, these diagrams and figuring out what controls we can apply where to protect uh, the risk from the threat model. Uh, let's see what else. Um, OWASP, Threat Dragon. Um, so OWASP.org, uh, we can take a look at this in a minute actually, I think. Um, OWASP Threat Dragon is an open source and free tool that can be used to create threat model diagrams and to record possible threats and to decide on their mitigations. Uh, threat Dragon is free. Uh, it's a tool from OWASP and we'll take a look at it in a minute uh, from OWASP.org on uh, the open web. What is that? I can't remember the acronym off the top of my head. I can look it up, but uh, Threat Dragon is both an online threat modeling web application, or they actually have a desktop application that's available for Windows and Mac, and you can download it. And I have it installed on my machine, and we can look at it in just a minute. But before we do that, um, here's an example uh, of a sample web application uh, main request data flow. So again, data flow diagram, where can the bad guys do stuff? stuff? So let's dive into this a bit. Um, let's see. I think I actually dive into it um, on the next slide. So on the left, you can see the diagram elements, right? You have a process, you have a store, which could be a data store or an identity store. Uh, you have an, a symbol for an actor, uh, could be a user or a bad you know, actor, um, an attacker. Uh, and then you have a symbol for a data flow and you have um, a dotted line for a trust boundary. And what I've done is I've highlighted the web application process at the moment in this picture. And so in this example that you can play around with and figure out how to model your own application threat uh, model, um, I've highlighted the web application. And so it shows me uh, over on the right, right? But I have the web application highlighted and then you can do in scope, out of scope. You can talk about privilege level, 
uh, context. And there's some um, other aspects to it, of course. The web browser, that's the one visiting the web application. Um, a dotted line, trust boundary, uh, the green line between the web application and the browser uh, is going to be a firewall, right? Uh, or a web application firewall. So you could have multiple firewalls potentially there. Uh, you could also have an API instance uh, for if this were an API instead of a web app. Um, and then you have the web application doing a put message based on some input that the user might be doing, like um, putting something into a shopping cart or submitting an order to purchase something on Amazon. That's going to put a message into a message queue. And so you have a trust boundary that goes into the message queue. How do you auth successfully and make sure that people can't abuse uh, and sort of specially craft a web request and put an item that they want purchased into someone else's cart so they pay for it, but it gets maybe delivered to them. And then, of course, the message queue has to be processed and talk to a back end worker, right? And then this is going to eventually talk to the database and you have worker configs that are reading. Anyway, so this is a, a nice example that comes out of the box uh, and you can modify it to match some of the things that you might be threat modeling. Um, clicking on the lightning bolt that I had selected previously here up at the top, clicking on the lightning bolt uh, in the gray menu bar while the web application was selected uh, brings up six suggested threats, uh, beginning with a generic spoofing threat. Uh, and then you record the mitigation if there is one and you either accept the threat or you ignore it and you move on to the next suggested threat. The tool is meant to help foster uh, discussion with the application developers, uh, with the application architects, with the infrastructure team who build it, uh, the network team who help configure it, and of course the infosec analyst. So this is application security essentially, right? Uh, and application architecture. Documenting the threat model for an application is a great way uh, to both educate the engineers and developers as well as identify issues in design uh, or data flow. And so this is basically, you know, um, it's not like an automated tool that's going to stop threats, um, but it is a tool to help you discuss and document what your threat model is and what kind of mitigations you have planned. And then you can use this um, for your pen testing, right? And to make sure that your mitigations are successful and able to achieve the desired result of keeping bad guys from messing with your app or your platform. Uh, in this case, I move on to threat number five out of six. Uh, and this one is a generic DOS uh, threat, right? Denial of service, which I think we spoke about in the previous lecture, right? A denial of service can be mitigated in several ways. Uh, if you have purchased a, a DOS subscription from a vendor, uh, you can simply record that here. Uh, if you have implemented uh, AWS API gateway quotas or rate limiting, and they're not the same. So a quota would be the total number of requests you'd expect from maybe a single IP address user agent combination. Um, like uh, at Marvel Comics, you know, how many comics do you expect someone to be able to buy in a day? And if someone's abusing the platform in some way and uh, people try, um, you can maybe see that, you know, they would violate a quota, which would be maybe, you know, buying 10,000 comics in one day, right? It doesn't have to be a low quota, it could be pretty high. Uh, and then rate limiting, of course, is how fast they're coming at you. So the quota could be untouched but they could go for, so let's say the quota was 10,000. The rate limiting could be, you know, um, 100 in a second, right? Or 60 in, in one second, or, you know, 100 in a minute, or I guess that's you know, another metric. Anyway, so you could have different rate limiting conditions that stop the API from being abused um, or brute forced or a denial of service attack, right? So there's different ways to mitigate it. You could actually have a DDoS, you know, or a DOS subscription that helps clean all the traffic that's malicious. Uh, that's coming from suspicious IP addresses or coming too fast. And then you can have um, other techniques, like I said, for uh, API gateway quotas and rate limiting controls that you set. And then you can also record that a mitigation, you know, uh, that as one of your mitigations. And then record the fact that you've set up these limits and you could potentially link to the ticket that implemented it um, and the ticket that was used to, to um, test and verify, right? Because you can't just say, oh yeah, we put in a rate limiting, but we never tested to see that it was invoked and it would block someone. All right, next up, um, let's talk about threat modeling of a voice assistant. Um, and I think I've presaged this discussion previously, and I think Ahmed Copter, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, put in a perfectly great example of 
attackers targeting the assets uh, uh, of a voice assistant and using lasers, you know, to unlock a door to someone's house uh, in Michigan. Or no, the guy was from Michigan. I forget where they recorded the video. But anyway, so there's multiple good stories about this. Um, Ars Technica has one as well as that YouTube video. Uh, threat modeling is more of a conversation, like I said, with developers uh, and the infrastructure team and the product team than a particular set of software tools. Like, for example, you might use in vulnerability scan, which is mostly tool based. So let's take a look at a voice assistant, uh, an internet connected speaker as an example for discussing threat modeling. Uh, these are the different examples uh, that I found on someone's paper talking about voice assistance. So the threat model includes a dolphin attack. Um, remember that the human ear can hear, I think between 20 Hertz and 22 kilohertz. Um, and that dogs and dolphins and things like that can operate above 22 kilohertz. So some of these microphones um, are listening at higher frequencies. They can hear what's happening there. And that's one of the ways actually they stop your A-L-E-X-A -E uh, from being triggered on a TV ad is because they send um, an ultrasonic out of human pitch you know, range um, uh, command to your voice assistant to ignore the command it's about to hear from the television commercial. So that when you know, someone on TV says, you know, um, hey, Google, you know, um, open the front door, you don't have a bunch of you know, doors opening um, on smart homes across the country that are watching the TV show or the advertisement at that time. So anyway, that's the upper round, upper bound, like 39 kilohertz range, dolphin attack, right? Ultra high frequency, supersonic, almost kind of um, ultrasonic ranges. Uh, and of course, a Wi-Fi man in the middle attack. You, know, you could potentially inject um, a Wi-Fi SSID with a stronger signal because uh, a lot of Wi-Fi just naturally gravitates to whatever SID uh, has more bars and promises a better connection. And so the man in the middle attack is one that works on these um, devices as well, especially in a larger home uh, or you know in multiple floors in an apartment. You know your neighbor's Wi-Fi could be closer to your smart speaker, and if it's Wi-Fi connected, again, you know, you could do a man in the middle attack. Uh, there's also Bluetooth attacks that can be performed. Uh, you need to be proximal to them, uh, but they're used in um, uh, you know, in the TV shows. For example, someone gets some kind of device near someone's phone and they use a Bluetooth attack on it. The same kind of thing could be done because the Bluetooth technologies have um, less robust security and authentication mechanisms. Uh, hidden voice commands. Um, I think that was fun and interesting example. And of course the laser attack, uh, which you all probably saw in the random channel on our Slack, where you shine a laser at the microphone, the MEMS for the voice commands. And you can actually tell it to do things just by shining light at it through a line of sight across the street um, or outside the house. And then there's also zero day mobile app attacks uh, that can be done because typically um, in general, you can attack the hardware, you can attack the software, you can attack the authorized users and the protocols. So these are basic threat model vectors, right? Used to communicate between the device uh, and the mobile app and the cloud servers, of course, because there's, um, I think, yeah, we already have that in the other uh, channel. So here, for example, you have a mobile app that helps you control, you know, the A-L-E-X-A or Google Home. And so that can be used as an attack as well. Uh, additional attack services, uh, firmware. So if you can get physical access to the voice assistant, you could potentially overwrite the firmware on it and install uh, malicious firmware that behaves differently, or just simply program a, a skill uh, that collides with the namespace for an existing skill that exfiltrates data. Uh, you can also do certificates and device unique keys. Uh, those are often not managed terribly well. Uh, login credentials, user or admin can be default out of the box and no one knows what they are and you don't change them and that's the, the manufacturer's fault for making a, a default admin credential that is in the manual, for example, potentially. Um, system configurations can also be um, part of the attack surface. Uh, event logs can be used to figure out who's accessing it and which devices you might want to try to spoof um, to get access. Uh, voice recordings is another attack surface. You know, can exfiltrate the recordings that are being streamed offline you know, to Google or to you know, Amazon uh, that's actually doing the processing of the voice commands and instructions. Network communications can be attacked, of course. Device resources, um, for example, microphone array and speakers and computing power, the battery, the network bandwidth, you know, debug interface, you know, different local storage that might exist on these devices. 
uh, all sorts of attack surfaces that can be used. Uh, so that takes us to the end of documentation to design and a little bit of threat modeling. Um, so now it's time to roll over to InfoSec in the news. So let me uh, change the share, change it to a uh, full desktop. And maybe I'll share sound as well in case there's anything interesting to listen to in the news this week. Um, and let me see what else did we have here. Um, I think there was something that I wanted to look at. Uh, it was in the chat. Uh, Open Web Application Security Project. Yes, that is uh, um, that is what OWASP stands for. So thank you for listening and following along, Ahmed. Uh, and of course, what the customer really needed, LOL. Yeah, that's definitely the uh, tire swing. All right, so let's um, jump out to our friend InfoSec in the news and just work backwards, you know, um, through some of the news stories and see which ones are relevant to high level diagrams, documentation, release notes, things like that. All right, this first one, not sure, um, blah, blah, blah not relevant. Uh, in 2021, Microsoft is planning to release exciting new Surface products and software updates for Windows 10. This includes Windows 10X, 10 Sun Valley Update, Windows Cloud PC. Uh, so this is a potential um, release note, right? Or at least pre-release note. Um, so we can certainly open this link for a minute and see what it tells us. Um, what to expect from Microsoft. So this is an article about um, a release. And I'm guessing it'll can include a link to the actual release notes. And so we can look at that and, and make a couple of observations about the style and tone. So the first update of the year, Windows 10 Spring 21 update. Let's look at the original document. All right, so this one, oh no, this is just another bleeping computer article. Interesting. Uh, wait, here we go. Microsoft has announced. That's got to be a Microsoft link. No, oh my God, they're making so many self-referential links in these articles. They're not actually linking out to Microsoft itself. Um, Microsoft announced today. Ah, so this one's finally a link that's not just bleeping computer referring to bleeping computer articles about it. Um, introducing the next feature update to Windows 10 version 21 H1. This is uh, published February 2021. It's regarding Windows 10. It's by John Cable, Vice President of Program Management. There's a link for you to look up all the articles by him. And so what is the style and tone of this? Well, it looks like they have a clearly pensive and educated person wearing glasses and a you know, sweater and a button down shirt sitting at a tastefully arranged desk with a small piece of uh, you know, um, greenery and some manipulatives, you know, maybe a fidget spinner or uh, some type of puzzle box and over on the right, a glass of water. So he's not drinking um, you know, a two liter bottle of Coke or Mountain Dew, and so he's got healthy lifestyle choices. Of course, he's using a Microsoft Surface that you can tell with the stylus, clearly brought into photo here. And so we've already set our mood, right, as to who the audience is for a Windows 10 user. And of course, this image may vary for you. If you go to this URL right now, you may see a completely different image, right? It could be one-to-one -one marketing. They could be doing all sorts of demographics, you know. That doesn't mean that you would see the same homepage um, for this article that I'm seeing. Uh, anyway, so today we, so it's inclusive already in its style and tone um, uh, because, you know, it's not saying Microsoft is, it's saying we, and so they're bringing you along as a user. Uh, as people continue to rely on Windows, you know, so they're also making a value statement here about their product. Um, you know, more fun uh, and, and learning and working. We understand the importance of the best possible experience, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, the style and tone has already been set. Um, and then here come some of the headers, right? Fast and focused, you got alliteration going on, a couple of F words, um, a bullet list of three. This is very common in documentation if you wanna make an emphasis. People like to list of three. Uh, customers running blah, 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 can choose, you know, oh good, we all like choice. We like to be, you know, in, in charge. Um, we, all Windows 10 editions will receive 18 months of servicing. Uh, next steps, so it's short and sweet, right? It's not a terribly long article. Um, they're just giving you, you know, some of the talking points about dates and different versions of Windows. Their multi-layered approach, you know, includes, and then they have some hyperlinks where you can go to get more information. We'll begin releasing to those uh, insiders who seek to opt in and new features will be offered in future Windows Insider preview builds as they are ready. 
Uh, what else? Um, editor's note, February 17th, the bullet point for Windows Hello multi-camera support was updated for clarity. So this is a work in progress, right? They added something after it was originally published and it looks like it came from February. Uh, and of course, Bleeping Computer wrote several articles about this. Uh, so that's metadata about a release. Uh, so that's a little bit of a dive into uh, a Microsoft's style for Windows 10 updates and you know, not overloading you with tons of information there. Um, actually, I think Bleeping Computer wrote like four times as much prose about that release um, than, um, than, uh, than Microsoft did themselves. Uh, let's see, a Windows hacker found a never before seen Easter egg in Windows 95 internet mail application 15 years after the software released. Well, that's just pure fun. We have to look at that for a second. Um, it is documentation, right? An Easter egg, right? And the fact that it was hidden, I don't know, for 25 years. I um, wonder why it said 15 before. Um, a Windows hacker has found a never before seen Easter egg in the Windows 95 internet mail application. When developing software, it's not uncommon for developers to slip in a secret hidden message, uh, which is, you know, fun Easter eggs, right? Easter eggs are a fun way to provide a small glimpse into a relaxed moment in the normally hectic and serious pace of software development. This week, a new Easter egg, blah, 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 discovered by Windows hacker and developer Albacore. Um, let's see who Albacore is real quick. Um, opening a secret window that displays a scrolling list of the developer's names. Uh, it's never too late to find Easter eggs. Happy to notice uh, what looks like never before egg in IE4 internet mail. Uh, to access the Easter egg, the user needs to launch internet mail, click on help, and then about. And when the about screen opens, click on the listed um, com ctl32 dll file. So it becomes highlighted and then type Mortimer on your keyboard. So I imagine someone found this string by doing, um, you know, decoding right of the binaries to see if there were vulnerabilities. I don't know who's looking for vulnerabilities in Windows 95 still. This is not a lot. There shouldn't be a lot of Windows 95 machines out there. But anyways, this is Albacore's um, uh, Twitter handle that was linked out. It looks like they have a medium link for who they are. Um, they joined Twitter in 2012. Um, 200 people following them. No, he's following 200 or she's following 200 and 6,301 followers. And the pinned tweet comes from January about the Easter egg, I think, right? Cleverly hidden content in old Windows betas. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to fire these up necessarily, but Windows NT betas contain their own variant of the product team Easter egg. Uh, so that's fairly recent stuff. Windows 95 build team credits. Uh, fix this group before we ship. Here's their fun remark. Shout outs to the setup banner artwork. Uh, so anyway, that's... Um, one little story, I guess, about uh, documentation that was buried inside of the product uh, as an Easter egg. So well, that's my excuse for sharing it with you for a minute. All right, let's close that up. <clears throat> let's find something else. Um, Fat Face sends controversial data breach email after ransomware attack. British clothing brand Fat Face sent a controversial confidential data breach notification to customers after suffering a ransomware attack earlier this year. So what is it about this communication, this storytelling, that was considered controversial? Uh, let's take a look. Um, British clothing brand Fatface has sent a controversial confidential data breach notification. This week, customers began receiving data breach notifications revealing that the popular lifestyle brand Fatface had suffered a data breach after a cyber attack on January 17th, 2021. Uh, data breach at Fatface, it feels a bit misleading. Our systems are fully secure and Fatface remains a safe place to shop online or in purpose, except for the data breach that they just had. So I guess that people are um, objecting to the nature of this tweet and the information that it said. Uh, let's read it real quick because we can do a little bit of an analysis of the type of storytelling that's going on, right? You want this to be a fairly factual, um, uh, terse kind of like reporting the news, right? Like the report stereotype. Um, but I think if people react to it the wrong way, then you can understand. So let's see, dear customer, we're contacting you that one of our valued customers uh, to let you know about a recent security incident, which involves some of our systems, including those that potentially held some information of value. Whilst we are unaware of any attempted or actual misuse of any of the information, out of abundance of caution, everyone likes that phrase, right? Uh, we wanted to give you some information about that event so you can understand what happened, how you may be involved, and the steps have been taken. 
Um, we'd like to show you this incident is now resolved and that full payment card information was not compromised. Our systems are fully secure and fat faced. So I think that's the disingenuous sentence going on right there that people think um, is, uh, you know, they, they were ransomware, they are not fully secure. Um, please keep this email and the information included within it strictly private and confidential. Of course, people are posting it, so they didn't do that. But anyway, what happened on Jan 17, 2021, they identified some suspicious activity within its IT systems. I'm not sure what kind of alerting and awareness might have happened, but my guess is that most breaches are caused by phishing, right? Or spear phishing and someone clicking on an email. So my guess is that there was a compromised credential of someone in fat face, which then led to a ransomware breach. Uh, we immediately launched an investigation with the assistance of an experienced security specialist who, following through, uh, following thorough, no, following thorough investigation, determined that an unauthorized party had gained access to certain systems operating by us during a limited period of time earlier the same month. Uh, Fatface quickly contained the incident and started the process of reviewing and categorizing the data potentially involved. We have now completed our review and are contacting you because the information may have included systems we want to provide you. What we've done, Fat Face takes security you know, extremely seriously. No one ever says anything other than that in one of these uh, statements, right? They all say, oh yeah, we kind of lax on security and we're gonna stay that way because it costs too much. That's not a message that people are gonna be putting out, right? So a lot of this is boilerplate kind of sentences, right? But you can get a bit of a sense of, of their style and tone here. Um, as soon as we became aware, we launched an investigation from experienced third-party security specialists. So they outsourced it, right? Um, ransomware breach, you want that plausible deniability that you did a bad job of um, remediating it and investigating it. So at this point, a lot of companies will decide to engage outside counsel and outside counsel will say, yeah, risk of lawsuits and um, you know, uh, data breach you know, penalties, better go with a third party, better not handle it in-house. Even the big guys don't do it in-house, right? Because they want that separation uh, from uh, discoverability in a potential class action suit that'll come against uh, Fatface for this unsafe handling of data and not having sufficient security practice and policy and tools in place to prevent it from happening. Uh, let's see, what else it say? Over the past few weeks, the teams have been working uh, flat out. So that's a very in English kind of phrase, right? Uh, to fully investigate the circumstances of the incident, confirm whose data may have been involved. Fatface had various preventative security measures in place at the time to protect your data in line with expected security practices and related technology for the retail sector Fatface operates in. So that's gonna be a lawyer that was saying, let's inject a sentence that says, we didn't have a defect, right? We had what's considered best practice security preventative measures. What those are, will probably come to light. Uh, and were they adequate or not is for the reader to decide at some point, right? Um, they may have thought they were adequate and they may have passed a security audit and a SOC 2 compliance test and a pen test. But that doesn't mean that you know one user clicking on something didn't uh, give over the whole farm. Maybe they need more multi-factor auth. Maybe just compromising one user's workstation shouldn't have led to a ransomware breach, right? Who knows? Uh, unfortunately, like many organizations, because this one talks exactly um, saying that an unauthorized user, AKA a hacker, um, accessed um, and gained access to the systems. So it wasn't just that they dropped a payload in an email attachment that landed that infected the systems. Someone had remote you know, access and they probably didn't have sufficient MFA for it. Maybe it wasn't a highly privileged user like an admin. And so they didn't think MFA was needed for the whole company. But I'm guessing before this sentence finishes or before this information rolls uh, you know, onto the next couple of comments that they're gonna be providing some type of identity uh, 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 monitoring services to the impacted users. Uh, everyone always offers that. That's kind of, you know, goes automatically. And uh, they're probably going to say, we're going to increase our security you know, technique even better. Uh, so the sentence says, unfortunately, like many organizations, we are subject to a sophisticated criminal attack. Yeah, it's never an unsophisticated criminal attack, although many times they are terribly unsophisticated criminal attacks. But everyone likes to say, oh, yeah, it was so bad. They were so smart, those bad guys. They sent me an email that promised, you know, to give me a $25 gift certificate or you know, two for one dinner or something. And they clicked on it and boom, they're hit with ransomware, uh, which involved access to our system despite these measures. Uh, consistent with our focus on customer care and regulatory requirements, including the UK and the EU General Data Protection Regulations, GDPR, 
Fat Face's priority has been on to clearly identify who was and was not involved and to identify precisely what information was involved so that we could explain to you what happened. Well, this doesn't sound terribly precise, right? They just said something happened. Some of you may have been involved. This identification effort was comprehensive and coordinated by our external security experts. It therefore took time to thoroughly analyze and categorize the data to ensure that we provide the most accurate information possible. So this is terribly accurate from a lawyer's point of view, but not from like an affected user. Um, you know, it doesn't say, you know, your credit card, you know, your home address, your you know, birth date, you know, email address, password, all those kinds of things are probably compromised, right? Um, so you can probably look around on Twitter to find even more information about this. Um, but it looks like Troy Hunt is, is beating them up on this one uh, and says, you know, except for the data breach. Uh, let's see what else. Access, according to the notification, threat actors access customer data typically involves mailing address, partial credit card information, and the last four digits and the expiration date. What was controversial about the data breach notification <clears throat> is that it told recipients, please do keep this email and the information included within it strictly private and confidential. Bleeping Computer has covered many breaches and we've never seen a company asking a user to keep the data breach confidential and likely has no power to make that request. As you can imagine, that single sentence led to quite an uproar on Twitter and users baffled that the notification would include that kind of language. Oh, and the subject of the disclosure email was strictly private and confidential. So some overzealous lawyer thought that they would have some type of you know, um, recourse, right? That they did, um, that they requested everyone to keep their email uh, confidential. That's a bit rich, you know, value customers, blah, blah, blah. You might say they were hacked compromised two months after it happened and asked me to keep it confidential. Of course, everyone knows about this hack, you know, all sorts of third parties write articles about it. So I think it's interesting, this article and the breach and the notification, the original prose from Fat Face um, was probably argued over, you know, extensively, probably weeks, right, where they came to what language to use, what kind of tone and style they wanted to communicate. And lawyers would say, like, you know, admit nothing, you know, make sure that it sounds like we had really good stuff. And it was just the sophistication of the bad guys that, you know, won out over the day. But really, it could have just been, you know, they had an intern, you know, that didn't have multi-factor auth and the ransomware landed and there was a breach or maybe it wasn't ransomware. Was it ransomware? Yeah, it was a ransomware attack. Um, so they probably exfiltrated the data and encrypted it. And Fatface probably paid the fine. Um, if we look real quick. Um, Fat face um, breach uh, ransomware. Uh, let's see, top ransomware acts, cyber threat report, confirm threats, uh, retailer. Fat face pays 2 million ransom to Conti cyber criminals. There we go. So that's what we're looking for. Um, $2 million ransom. Uh, why? Well, they probably didn't have backups. If they had had backups, then they wouldn't have to pay the ransom, would they? Um, and the Conti ransomware gang following a successful cyber attack on its system that took place in January, Computer Weekly has learned. Uh, what else can we learn? Ransomware operators initially demanded a ransom of $8 million, approximately 213 Bitcoin at the prevailing rate, but were successfully talked down during a protracted negotiation process. So yeah, definitely make sure you have a Bitcoin tumbler and um, ransomware negotiator contracts on retainer ready to go. You don't want to be doing red lines and doing a master services agreement with a person that's going to help you negotiate your ransomware. Uh, uh, you definitely want someone to do the negotiation for you. So I get that ahead of time this is the best practice. Uh, during discussions, the negotiator for the COVID hit retailer told Conti's representative that since shutting its brick and mortar stores, it was only making 25% of its usual revenues. So to pay 8 million would mean to end the business. This was rejected on the basis that fat face cyber insurance policy held with specialist Beasley Furlong covers extortion to the tune of 7.5 million pounds, substantially more than 8 million US dollars. Ultimately, the significant factor in the reduction was the apparent deletion from fat faces storage area network of a number of virtual machines and data from primary business apps, including its electronic point of sale EPOS system, SAP business intelligence reporting, merchandising app, warehouse management system, SQL Server cluster, and Citrix hosts, the recovery of which would cause further damage. Conti's representative denied responsibility for this and is unclear from the negotiation logs how it happened. Uh, so there was a significant loss of, of infrastructure, right? Because the ransomware guys are kind of like, they need to maintain a Yelp or an equivalent of a Yelp profile for you know returning your data um, uh, when you pay. 
But because all this destruction happened, it could have been accidental. It could have been, you know, overzealous people coming in to try to get the bad guys off the platform. Uh, what's funny here is that this looks like, yeah, a negotiation log. So ransomware has customer support people outsourced and they work through a script and they negotiate just like anyone, you know, um, trying to get like um, you know, a merchandise request, an RMA request for a, um, a computer that was shipped and purchased that showed up that didn't work or someone that bought some clothes and the clothes were too small or too big and they want to send it back. A lot of retailers, you know, have policies um, to let you do that, um, but some of them need you to fight a bit for it. So here is actually a screenshot of them chatting with ransomware support, right, <laughs> and helping you get through your ransomware instance. And so you have to think it's it's almost like um, you know uh, an evolved customer outsource, right? And so they're saying, well, your online sales seem pretty nice to me, blah blah blah. I need some time to discuss with my boss if we have go down a bit, though. Um, basing on the fact that you have a large offline retail network and we will review the financial documents that are in our possession. Yes, please discuss with your boss. We have a e-commerce presence, but it is small and only makes up about 25% of our res revenue. The majority of our sales and profit comes from our stores, which typically come to a halt, uh, have basically come to a halt 27 days ago. What about your cyber insurance? Most of our attacks are covered by the insurance companies, right? So they're saying like, can't you ask your parents, you know, for more money uh, to pay for, you know, this uh, broken, uh, you know, uh, website? Seems like we've found what you looked for in your papers. Our demands are lower than your insurance coverage. I had no idea how this can break you when you're insured to 7.5 million uh, British pounds. So they definitely had inside information, right, to be able to look at that because the coverage amounts are not necessarily always um, publicly available. Uh, further on, this discussion is, is quite fun and interesting uh, about this hack. Uh, we're ready to make it fast, but we need a better offer. <laughs> right? Make a step towards us and we'll make the same. Right? So this is just like pure negotiation, right? Um, it's hard for us to be more timely because there's an analysis and an approval and I haven't told everyone of our $5 million offer because it would take three to four days to get an answer from our side. Anyway, so the fact that there are you, we are ready to accept 2.65 million. Thank you very much. I will tell everyone immediately and we will have a meeting tomorrow to discuss, blah, blah, blah. So it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, to see that uh, you know, these logs um, are part of the breach disclosure um, and uh, what else? It's offering its customers a 12 month subscription to experience identity theft, of course, as we expected. Uh, customers who blah, 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 ICO spokesperson, this is the, uh, was it called the Independent Council Office or whatever? Um, it's an acronym for the UK. Um, you know. Um, anyway, I can't remember what the ICO stands for. Uh, here it is, Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, they're the ones that had to be notified and involved because you don't want Fat Face to get um, thrown in jail for supporting organized crime. So they must have put it through a Bitcoin expendler, uh, handler. Uh, let's see, Conti and Evasive Ryuk uh, descendant. Uh, so the successor is the Ryuk ransomware. Conti is a live global threat that has hit multiple organizations in, in recent months. The majority of victims uh, in the retail, manufacturing, and construction sectors, according to Sophos researchers. Sophos, of course, had a couple of breaches in the last year as well. They're not terribly uh, on top of it. Uh, the ransomware most commonly arrives through disclosed software or hardware vulnerabilities, remote desktop, uh, remote desktop protocol exploitation or phishing. Um, if we did a quick end map of uh, Fatface, I hope we wouldn't find any remote desktop protocols open, right? It's for RDP port 3389. Um, but anyway, according to Cove, where Conti's operators tend to carefully research their targets and scale their ransomware demands accordingly. However, the average, of average ransomware payment made as of February 2020 was a little over 740,000. Uh, so they got paid, they had to pay 2 million to get their stuff back. Uh, and because, and be, they didn't have to pay 5 or 8 million because there was some destruction that happened along the way. Uh, so, fun story um, in the sense that it's a cautionary tale for the rest of us, right? How we should do. Uh, let's see, the negotiations ultimately led to a payment of 2 million to gain access to a decryption key and promise not to leak the 200 gigabytes of stolen data. So they exfiltrated the data. They didn't launch a DDoS attack against them probably, uh, although some of them are amplifying their ability to get paid uh, with those kinds of things. Uh, the Conti gang then provided the victim with a report on how to better protect their 
support. So you can imagine this is like your customer satisfaction survey, and they're going to send them an email. Like, How was your experience, you know, with us as your ransomware? Um, would you recommend us, you know, to a colleague, <laughs> right? Um, out of all of the ransomware actors and gangs out there that could hit you, are you happy that you, you know, with the care that you were given by our customer support agreement, please fill out this survey and we'll make sure that they do a better job of helping you learn how to pay. But this is one of the funny things, right? Is that the Conti gang provided them with a report on how to protect, including email filtering, phishing awareness tests, better Active Directory password policies, EDR technology, right? Endpoint detection and uh, response technology to stop the ransomware outbreak uh, at patient zero or maybe patient one or two, and then not spread to the whole infrastructure. And of course, an offline backup strategy. Uh, so it's customer care, it's, it's quality of care. They don't want someone else to come in and suck them dry, you know, uh, on a second breach or a re-infection. Um, what else? Uh, from the team uh, was able to gain general administrative rights and began to move laterally through the network, identifying the retailer cybersecurity installations, Veeam backup servers, and Nimble storage. The ransomware attack itself was executed on 17 January and saw more than 200 gig of data exfiltrated. Um, so yeah, they targeted the backup servers and encrypted the backups apparently as well. Uh, so that's not cool. That's not how backups are supposed to work. Backups are supposed to be your get out of jail card so you don't have to pay $2 million. And of course, how much would it have cost to do a backup um, plan and to you know implement good backups so that you don't have to pay it? I'm guessing it would be less than $2 million. Um, so anyway, an ounce of prevention, pound of cure, right? Well, they just paid $2 million worth of cure. And hopefully they get better at it. Uh, let's see, future focus, a safer way to expose uh, private server names. No, watch out, the Android system update may contain a powerful spyware. Oh, great, just the last thing we need. Um, spyware inside of Android updates. Um, Apple issues urgent patch and update for a zero day under attack. Uh, if you're running an Apple iOS device and you didn't see this come out on Friday evening, uh, you know it's serious. If it was a Friday evening patch, the only thing in the update was security updates. So you should uh, patch uh, and update all of your iOS devices immediately if you, if you haven't done so already. Uh, this is the same story about the patch and update. I guess we can look at um, Apple's, um, there ought to be a link to the Apple uh, release notes for this update somewhere in here, right? Uh, as a part of documentation. So tracked as CVE 2021-1879, the vulnerability relates to a WebKit flaw. So it's actually vulnerable on Mac OS, um, tablet iOS, and watch OS, if I remember correctly. Uh, or wait, maybe not Mac OS, just iOS. And, um, and then where is the um, uh, release? Uh, where is Apple's note? Here's the Apple um, release notes. So let's take a look at their documentation style. So about the security content, right? Um, again, you have like a nice header. It's not a sentence. Um, this is a sentence, um, has a verb, right? But this one's just about the security content of iOS 12.5.2. Oh, that's right. They even backported it to older devices, uh, which is why uh, it's not just 14.4.2 or something which means it's super serious, right? If they decided to open up a deprecated versions for um, iPhone 5S, iPhone 6, 6 Plus, iPad minis, right? If they're backdating it to sixth generation stuff, that means it's pretty significant. Um, Clement uh, Lissigan of Google Threat Analysis Group and Billy Leonard of Google Threat are credited with this. So this is really short, right? This is not a lot of information. Um, where would you get more information? Uh, recent releases are listed there. Uh, reference CVID where possible. This is just a link to MITRE.org about what a CVE is. For more information about security, this is their generic support page. So not a lot of information here other than the CVE. So they kept it very short and sweet. It's published on March 26th. Today is the 27th. Um, information about product, blah, blah, blah. Contact the vendor, blah, blah, blah. Disclaimer, light gray text, you know, bunch of visual formatting here, lines to separate things. And this is the way I think Apple tries to keep their stuff going, um, you know, in terms of, you know, st t style and tone. Uh, let's see what else. And then this is the 14, uh, 402 update. Again, you know, something without a period, uh, then the full sentence um, about updates. This is generic. This is boilerplate 
content that doesn't have anything to do with the details. Uh, and then it talks about the WebKit, and it's pretty much the same kind of thing with just a few different devices. Um, so this is very, definitely very templated and exceedingly um, short and sweet. Uh, they don't want to go into the details and tell you, you know, how the hack is, um, you know, uh, used and, and who's exploiting it. But the fact that they released it like that means that it was actively being exploited in the wild. All right, what else can we say about documentation for uh, a couple more stories here? Um, Apple issues, Apple issues, everyone's freaking out. Cybersecurity, where you are, podcasts, no. Apple issues, urgent patch, already did it. New Android malware spies on you while posing as a system update. Okay, so it's not an actual system update. Um, exploring the human fingerprints on malware, no. This Week in Ransomware, no. Apple Zero Day, Threat Roundup from Security. Um, yeah, this is documentation, right? This is a blog. Um, let's see what kind of level of detail they provide. So Cisco wants you, and for you should, you know, follow some of their stories, right? Their Threat Roundup for the week. Um, today, Talos is publishing a glimpse into the most prevalent threats we've observed. As with previous roundups, this post isn't meant to be in depth. It's meant to be read shortly, you know, uh, quickly over a cup of coffee, potentially. And down here, it's done, right? And so where's the thing? Well, I guess the thing is this, right? Um, read more to that roundup. So they actually have a landing page. And then the actual page, right? So they can tell through analytics how deep into this story you're getting. Did you just hit that landing page or did you click through? Um, so I think they're intentionally keeping the content from a single click so that they can watch um, how far people go into reading it. Uh, so anyway, this is the detail. As a reminder, this is not exhaustive. It doesn't mean there aren't other vulnerabilities out there, of course. For each threat described below, the blog only lists 25 of the associated file hashes it up to 25 indicators of compromise, the IOCs for each category. The accompanying JSON file can be found here that includes the complete list of file hashes. <coughs> so someone would download that and ingest it into their <coughs> threat intelligence uh, platform and their um, security tools, like their firewall and their endpoint tools. If they're not Cisco based, you could still ing ingest the IOCs because they're fairly um, generic. All right. So what are they seeing? Uh, Windows malware, Windows malware, Windows malware, right? Um, Ursu is a net genetic, uh, sorry, generic malware that has numerous functions that consists of command and control, which is what C2 stands for, command and control server and platform code injection. Zussi, known as Tiny Banker is a Trojan that uses man in the middle attacks to steal banking information. When executed, it injects itself into legitimate Windows processes, uh, such as explorer.exe. Uh, this we talked about before in vulnerability management, living off the LAN, using a trusted binary and injecting your bad code into it. Uh, this one's a downloader. Banload is a banking Trojan believed to be developed by Brazilian cyber criminals and used primarily to infect machines in Latin America. One notable aspect of band load is the use of custom kernel drivers to evade detection. Interesting. Um, so they're writing special software to get around detection. Uh, Rustkill, also known as Dorkbot, is a botnet client that steals credentials and facilitates denial of service, distributed denial of service attacks, and spreads via removal media and instant messaging apps. Interesting. So anyway, these are some of the indicators of compromise and some of the keys. Uh, that you can download, uh, places you might look for it uh, in the Windows registry, of course, um, mostly uh, Windows stuff. And then, of course, here the IP addresses are kind of put brackets around the dots so no one can click on them accidentally and get infected because these are the uh, addresses that known to be contacted uh, does not indicate maliciousness. It just means they were contacted by the malware. Um, files and directories created. Uh, looks like Outlook files. Um, what else? Uh, these are potentially some Unix. Uh, no, no, maybe not users. Uh, root. Interesting. No, no, not Unix. Uh, so this is just basically the user's path on Windows, apparently. Uh, and then see the JSON for the rest. Uh, coverage. So they tell you what their tools can do here, right? AMP protects you. Cloud locks not applicable. Uh, email security, yes. Stealthwatch not applicable. Uh, so they're basically reinforcing their brand and saying what it would look like if it detected one of these Cisco AMP would be running. Um, so that's certainly uh, a Talos bit of uh, 
public uh, relations uh, and their weekly threat feed. Uh, what other kind of documentation stories are there in here? Uh, SolarWinds experimenting with new software build system in the wake of breach. Well, I would hope so, because I mean, that was a thing that they took care of, right? And it whacked um, uh, during the breach to set the back door into everything. Uh, NGA picks four states for latest cyber policy academy. Now New York expanding its mobile vaccine passport. Um, not really a documentation and sign um, uh, discussion, I don't think. Uh, hackers against, again, target German MPs. Several German lawmakers have once again fallen victim to a cyber attack. Local media said Friday with security experts pointing the finger at Russian hackers. These could have been mo you know, mobile phone users. Let's check. Uh, were they iOS users? Um, was this part of the reason that um, the story came out and Microsoft released uh, their update on the 26th? Um, I wonder if they disclosed whether it was um, Android or iOS. Um, let's see. Hackers use phishing emails to gain access to the computers of at least several federal MPs and 31 lawmakers. Okay, so it's probably not mobile-based then. Uh, spokesperson for the lower house of parliament confirmed the cyber attack but said there is currently no indication of a direct attack on the IT infrastructure of the German Bundestag. Um, security experts suspect Russia's GRU <clears throat> being behind the attack. Der Spiegel said, though, the ghostwriter group, which reportedly specializes in spreading dis disinformation. <clears throat> it remains unclear. It remains unclear if any sensitive information was accessed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the most high profile incident blame. So it's not really coughing up any details, but it did say um, computers and not mobiles. Oh, so we don't know if it was Windows, probably Windows, but we'll see. 40% uh, of all app apps are leaking information according to White Hat Security, another Apple patches zero day. Executive order would strengthen cybersecurity requirements for federal agencies. Um, I think this is a pending uh, executive order that hasn't come out yet. Um, Someone, I think, got access to a draft of the executive order that's coming out. Let's see if it tells us anything interesting about that. Threat post. <clears throat> the post solar winds executive order could be issued as soon as next week. The federal government is mulling changes to its cybersecurity software game in the wake of the sprawling Windows cyber attacks that came to light in December. In a draft order, software companies would be required to disclose any security issues to government users, according to a report from Reuters. So I think they're actually currently required to do it now, but they don't do it enough. And so this would be trying to strengthen that um, guidance. Um, and then this gives you context because they don't have any real new information. Uh, but this is the source report. Apparently Reuters broke this story. And what is the narrative, right? It, they're not trying to scare you. They're not trying to freak you out too much. It's trying to just say this happened, this happened. So. To me, this feels like the report, right? It's just saying Biden administration is going to do an executive order that will require many software vendors to notify, uh, and that should provide more shared of information instead of people sitting on it for months. Uh, there will probably be guidelines around timeliness of reporting, uh, hopefully structured reporting, so that we can um, retrieve the report breaches and frequencies um, programmatically <clears throat> and add it to our scoring platform for security scorecard. Uh, let's see, nothing else. The order could be released as early as next week. Where do they talk about them seeing a copy of it? The proposed order would adopt measures long sought by security experts, including requiring multi-factor auth and encryption of data inside federal agencies. So these are just basic mitigations, right? Uh, oh, and a software bill of materials. That's the phrase. Uh, this is called a BOM, right? A bomb. Uh, so... It's interesting. So the order would impose additional rules on programs deemed critical, such as requiring a software bill of materials, like a packing list uh, that spells out what's inside. An increasing amount of software activates other programs, expanding the risk of hidden vulnerabilities. So now we're talking about supply chain and open source code scanning, right? And saying if someone attacks an open source library, they want to have a complete bill of materials saying what was inside of it. So imagine the Microsoft hack of uh, the on-prem exchange servers, right? They're using a library that is doing a basic proxy function for the Outlook web access that was abused to get at the backend servers of um, a Microsoft exchange cluster uh, for on-prem at least. So the, it would compel vendors to, preser to preserve more digital records as well. Uh, but this one, this whole bill of materials is interesting. 
Uh, and in this space, you basically have something like Sonatype. And I've talked about their software before. I'm not a shareholder of Sonatype stock, uh, but I do like uh, their product. And they did a recent acquisition of something called um, uh, DevMuse, I think it's called, which helps automate this. Uh, but basically, they you know run analysis as you're building your software and before it gets released. And they have you know billions of um, you know, packages in their Maven repository that are people are using. And this is a good view as to what their interface looks like. So if you're a developer and you're including some software and you, and you include uh, WebGoat um, components and you have common Apache common collections 3.2.1, it's got an Apache license, you're on 3.2.1. And out here you can see that some of the stable secure versions are and that you just need to, you know, mitigate or migrate to that version. So it'll help you automatically update to a new package version and the latest stable and secure version. So the bill of materials is going to be like really long lists of the packages and libraries that are involved in building software. And I don't know that the government's going to be terribly smart at figuring out what to do with that. But as long as everyone starts publishing a packing list, then you won't have you know the sort of investigations that will take extra long to figure out what type of license you know is used or what type of you know, version of the software is there does it have a vulnerability nexus iq found policy violations you know so they they check the license compatibility uh, and automatically generate a software bill of materials a bom software bomb so that's the kind of software that's going to be shooting through the roof if the government requires this, right? Things that unpack and look at all the packages uh, and expose, you know, uh, which ones have um, risk, uh, which ones are insecure. And I suppose, you know, the government would force them to do some type of remediation timeline on those vulnerabilities once they're scanned and identified. And so requiring that bill of materials in a structured, consistent manner will make Sonotype's life easier with their products like like lifecycle and nexus iq for scanning code um, and other companies do this as well they're not the only company uh, that's in this space uh, but they're well poised to take advantage of that software bill of materials interesting outcome all right so there was a little bit extra detail here in this reuters article that didn't make it into what i can see here um bill oh wait there it is yeah they did talk about the bill of materials okay so they did surface it um but uh, anyway, the NSC spokeswoman said that the EO would be released as quickly as next week, but the final decision on exactly what will go into it has yet to be made. So I imagine they're getting some feedback, right, from a lot of the software companies that work um, with the government and that would be impacted by this to figure out how much is it going to cost you to comply with um, this software bill of materials and disclosure, you know, reporting timelines, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 24 hours, who knows what the requirements are going to be. I guess it would depend on the criticality of the information that they're hosting. And it would also require what the vendors keep digital records and work with the FBI and CISA on incident response. Uh, so I think that would be good in general. Both of these things I think would be good uh, to improve our resilience and awareness of risk uh, with various software vendors. And if most of them work with the government, then the private sector would benefit as well, because uh, we would hopefully be able to see that same information. So it looks like the National Security Council is the one that's uh, driving this right now. So we got a couple minutes left, probably um, another story, and then we're done. Um, Microsoft shares exchange server post compromise attack activity. Uh, Microsoft shares details of what's happening to the companies after they got hit, right? With cryptocurrency botnets and ransomware and you know, email compromise. Uh, but let's see if we can find a pure up documentation uh, uh, and diagramming kind of um, story. Employee lockdown stress may spark cybersecurity risk. Younger employees and caregivers are under more stress than other groups and more shadow IT usage. Yeah, not a documentation story, but certainly an interesting one. A day in the life of a DevSecOps manager. Interesting story, but not this week's topic. Um, Apple fixes zero day. Got it. Uh, free intelligence on hackers. No. Data bias and machine learning implications for social justice. Awesome, awesome topic, but not really a documentation and design um, uh, story. 
Um, blah, blah, blah. Reuters exclusive on SolarWinds executive order. Already discussed that. How to set up a VPN. Um, yeah, it is documentation, but not really what I'm looking for. Sierra Wireless partially restores network following ransomware attack. Uh, we've already looked into a couple of ransomware stories. Let's uh, skip that. Insurance giant CNA hit with a novel ransomware attack. When someone says novel, it just means, you know, we weren't expecting it, but that doesn't mean it was novel. It may well have been just a random, regular old uh, ransomware attack. Uh, let's see, Microsoft, Black Kingdom ransomware hacked 1,500 exchange servers. So these are the web shells that got deployed after that first set of um, proxy logon vulnerabilities. So this is a follow on, you know, second stage attacks and, and exploitations and compromise. Um, severe flaws in Facebook for WordPress plugin. Yeah, I never want to use WordPress if I can avoid it. Uh, QNAP urges users to secure device against brute force attacks. Uh, this one's a pretty big deal, but it's not in the news. OpenSSL releases the patches for two high severity vulnerabilities. So whenever OpenSSL has a vulnerability, the whole world has to patch pretty quick a whole bunch of stuff. And so uh, this is the CVE that affects all OpenSSL, which is millions of devices, right? Um, anything that has an SSH or TLS interface, right? Even your smart IoT devices uh, are going to have an SSH instance or, sorry, SSL is going to be running OpenSSL and they're going to remain vulnerable for a while, right? Who's going to be updating the firmware on your smart light bulbs, you know, um, that are connected for changing the color uh, of Philips Hue and, you know, um, things that you know, are very much IoT kind of related. Uh, so this one I think is a big deal. And I guess we could potentially look at OpenSSL's, um, you know, style, right? Because we looked at Microsoft, we looked at Apple. Uh, OpenSSL is an open source project, right? And so for us to find a link on OpenSSL.org is what we're looking for, for tone and style. Uh, so here they have a very clean interface. It looks like Apple, you know, from, you know, maybe 10 years ago or something, right? With this kind of rounded, slightly 3D gradient. Um, and if we look at their website real quick, um, to see what they're running it on. So they're running it on Apache 2.4.29 on Ubuntu. So they really ought to just limit that to Apache that's doing information disclosure here. I'm not sure if 2.4.29 is the latest version. Let's see real quick. Um, Apache release. 2.4.29 was released in 2017. <laughs> so that means it's four year old uh, web server version. Maybe they're running, no, they're running Ubuntu. So this means it's probably vulnerable. But anyway, um, so OpenSSL is publishing this vulnerability. Um, looks like a whole bunch of links for you to go back to multiple years. They try to get you on the latest versions. So it's pretty concise, right? It's not too crowded. Not a lot of images going on here. That's good. Uh, they're talking about the vulnerability and it has to do with an X509 V flag for strict, enables additional security checks. Um, it is not set by default, starting with OpenSSL 1.1.1H. Check to disallow certificates in the chain that have explicitly included, sorry, that have explicitly encoded elliptic curve parameters was added as an additional strict check. An error in the implementation of this check meant that the result of a previous check to confirm uh, was overwritten. This effectively bypasses the check that non-CA certificates must not be able to issue other certificates. Uh, interesting. That's pretty uh, pretty scary. Uh, and then there's a second one, right? Uh, an open TLS server may crash if a sent a maliciously crafted um, renegotiation renegotiation client hello message from a client. If a TLS v.1.2 renegotiation client hello omits the signature algorithms extension uh, where it was present in the initial uh, but it includes signature algorithm cert extension then a null pointer dereference will result leading to a crash uh, the server is only vulnerable if it has tls 1.2 and renegotiation enabled which is the default open tls clients are not impacted by this issue only uh servers i guess all right um Users of versions should upgrade to 1.1.k. OpenSSL 1.0.2 is not impacted. So anyway, uh, very clear, but 
kind of technical details that um, security folks need to understand in order to do uh, their jobs and follow some of these stories and uh, understand what impacts your organization and what does not. Uh, so that takes us to 602. Um, I did have that one little bio break running away to go um, and come back. So apologies for that, but I am human. And that takes us to the end of the lecture, uh, documentation to design and storytelling and all sorts of fun topics uh, on how to uh, improve the quality of documentation in any organization you may be working in. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I will be doing some more grading this weekend. You may have noticed I caught up. I did about half of the open assignments uh, are now graded and submitted. Um, most people are doing quite well there. I took a point off for one or two users um, and I gave them a chance to resubmit if they want. But losing one point out of the whole set of assignments is not going to really mater materially affect your grade. Um, and if you have any questions about your um, team projects, I've seen a couple in email and in Slack and I have responded to them. So it's uh, certainly um, uh, an open channel for me. If you have any questions there, I'll try to get back to them uh, in a fairly expedient uh, fashion and timeliness. Uh, but I am busy working and teaching uh, and grading and you know uh, anything like that. So do leave me a little bit of um, uh, leniency, I guess, in your expectation of when you would uh, expect me to respond, you know, a day or two, three, maybe. Um, but anyway, so that's it. I will stop the recording and we will see you next week. Thank you for joining uh, those that are here live and those that are watching at home. Uh, you get to fast forward through that pause when I stepped away from the camera. All right. Very good. Thanks, everyone.